Thank you, Wogan. Uh, LMC TV. Thank you, sir. Uh, need a motion to open the work session. So moved. Second. All in favor. Aye. Uh, we have a new employee for the village who works in the uh, clerk treasurer's department. Sally, would you like to introduce? Yes, right there. New employee D. Yeah. D, would you like to come up to the, the podium, please? Not really an option. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. Um, yes, we have a new employee in the court treasurer's office. Her name is Adalia Del Valle. She goes by D. She started with us as a temporary employee in March, and we liked her so much that we asked her to stay. So she's going through the process now with civil service, and uh, she became a permanent employee a couple of weeks ago. And she's wonderful. She's helping out a lot, and she's doing a great job. Sorry, everyone, this is Dee. Thank you, Dee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. 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 No, <laughs> you're not. <done. laughs> Thank you very much, Dee. Uh, okay. We have a lot of folks in the audience who have uh, come for special uh, reasons. Uh, the first one I'm going to take is the, uh, the folks who uh, keep us safe and healthy. Uh, the EMS service, MEMS, they'd like to do a little presentation. And we have Kyle and Jason, please introduce yourself to the home audience. Thanks, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to the trustees. We're really uh, grateful and appreciative to be here tonight. Um, I'm Kyle Wilkie Glass, I'm the senior board member uh, in the Marinick EMS. I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Jason Cabalba, who serves as our, uh, our chief. Well, we're here tonight on, on the occasion of our 50th anniversary. We were founded in 1973. And we're really happy to be here. We're happy to be uh, an organization serving the village of America. Um, the Marinick Emergency Medical Service has a really rich history in the village with a commitment to providing life saving emergency medical care to the residents of the village of Marinick. And Rynek. As you can imagine, being in such close proximity to I 95, the Hutchinson Parkway, Metro North, and a whole host of other different transit uh, in the area, we're kept fairly busy. Um, but it's really something that we're quite passionate about. Um, and we do this with our 73 members, many of whom are residents in the building. Um, our organization's journey over the last 50 years really reflects uh, an evolution of emergency services and emergency medical services in New York State. We were one of the first emergency medical services to be found in New York State. We're really proud of um, where we have where we've come from um, through the hard work of our founder, John P. Quadrini Jr. Um, and, um, and many other uh, members who continue to be with us today. John and his wife, Lucille, actually fundraised through plaid stamps to buy the first ambulance. <laughs> uh, and John was not only devoted uh, to our organization as a founding member, but he was devoted to the village uh, through the fire department as well at the Halstead Manor Fire Department. Um, even the land that the building is on, this was donated for the purpose of providing emergency medical services in the village of America, which really shows you uh, the commitment and the importance that village residents have seen over time. Um, we are incredibly honored to fulfill this role in the village. Uh, it is something that as a volunteer organization, we are really inspired by the number of people who come forward every day and every year to put their put their time out there. Um, and we're so proud of the work that we do. I'm gonna hand it over to Jason now who will talk a little bit more about how we operate in contemporary times. Thank you. Hello everyone. Um, just to kind of touch on how we are currently operating, uh, we have a staff of between 73 to, to 80 people. Uh, it, it varies. Um, we have uh, four vehicles, which for us is um, you know, remarkable. We have two ambulances. We have a Gator, uh, which is kind of an off-road rescue vehicle, which we use for Saxon trails, the harbor, uh, parks, uh, all different types of uh, areas. And we have a uh, fly car, which is kind of a first response vehicle. Uh, we just purchased a new ambulance. Uh, actually, we ordered it three years ago. It just showed up about <laughs> two weeks ago. Um, and we are in the process of fundraising for the next ambulance. So we have two trucks uh, that have a 10-year lifespan, and we replace one every five years. Uh, unfortunately, we were just told that the cost of the ambulance went up about 38%. 
So we bring in on average about $45,000 a year in donations, uh, but we need to raise about 280,000 in a five-year spend. So obviously we solicit all the public's help uh, you know, to help us reach this, you know, this goal uh, because these are life-saving pieces of equipment uh, that, that go on over 2,000 falls a year uh, for service, not just here in the village, but at large Marshmont, the town of Maranek, uh, we respond mutual aid. So that is, that is kind of our ask uh, is, is for everybody's help. Uh, you know, we do a fundraiser once a year. And like I said, we're, we're trying to get the next truck. This fundraiser you do by mail? Yeah, we send out a mailer uh, once a year in November, uh, basically to every residence uh, in the village. Uh, we send out about 10,000 uh, envelopes. We get back about 450, uh, and it equates, give or take, to $45,000. Like I said, we are continuously fundraising uh, because an ambulance now is just under you know, $300,000. That's completely equipped and uh all right. And the price has gone up remarkably. Fifteen years ago we paid a hundred thousand dollars for a truck. But that is just kind of where the industry is at this point. But to Kyle's point, we are super proud to serve the village and we're grateful to have the support of everyone. And we'd like to invite anyone to stop by our station and see the crew, see the new truck, and get it to the building. Yeah, I just want to stay for interest of disclosure. Uh my youngest son, Michael, is a licensed EMT and he now volunteers with you guys. Yes, he's a great member. I actually spoke to him uh, over the weekend. We're going to get him driver trained. He's going to drive that moment. Minutes. I told him how to drive. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I will also and, say that um, my grandmother was one of the founding members of EMS. That's awesome. That's fantastic. We didn't know that. Um, we'd also be remiss just to, to not thank the mayor, the trustees, the village manager's office, the clerk, uh, clerk treasurer's office, as well for all the support that you give us on an annual basis. It is really um, an honor to be able to partner with you all. We thank you for your support. Well, thank you for everything you do. You know, I've uh, had occasion, my family, to use your services, and you guys have always been professional, helpful, and caring when you came to the call. Thank you, Mayor. Um, if I could. You uh, can. Chief Capalbo is also- Hold on, hold on. You. I want everybody to catch every word. Chief Capalbo is a member of our emergency operations team and uh, participates with us on a monthly basis when we do our training. And we rely on him um, when it comes to um, keeping ourselves safe as well as the people who, uh, who, who need uh, ambulance services. So we appreciate that uh, from you guys as well. Uh, I know you're a volunteer and you're a volunteer doing that as well. So I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Very, very appreciate it. And it's an honor to be part of the team as well. You do excellent work. Thank you. Do you uh, I have a question. Oh. Do you guys have an ask? Um, we don't really have a specific ask. The only ask we have is any help that was helping us whether it's up here where any grants, state funding, soliciting the residents. That's basically our biggest ask. We operate with a small budget provided by the town from our billing revenue, and that pays for basic things such as electricity, diesel fuel, uh, water, natural gas. Uh, but all the major capital purchases, like the actual vehicles, we purchase those 100% through donations. We did have some some uh, repairs as the item, mm -hmm. right? That we were able to do uh, that went through. We, we took a tour. Of it. Yeah, took a tour of that. Yeah. Yeah. Very very helpful. Yeah, we were very helpful. That. Um, yeah. I think a couple of years ago also, we were able to uh, help purchase one of the ambulances through one of our contracts that we participated in. I think we actually were able to get you a lower price than you may have originally been quoted. Yeah, so, about, about 15 years ago, we got one ambulance through uh, New York State Assistance to Firefighters Grants. Uh -huh. uh, and then not the most recent truck, but the one before that, uh, we have an account here uh, at the village, our ambulance fund, and since it's through the municipality, uh, we have to go out to bid, so we were able to get a cheaper price uh, through the bid uh, for the ambulance. Can, can we uh, ask our our, uh, our grant person to see if there's any grants available for them? Grant person? <laughs> well, I mean, we, we have a grant writer. I can, I can ask. I mean, uh, I might know of some. Yeah, I mean, the, the ones I know of top matter, these is the prior writer's grants. I don't know if you had a chance to speak with either uh, Senator Minotis or uh, State uh, Senator Mayor 
sometimes they have member item grants that are available. So actually, I did reach out to uh, Senator Shelley Mayer's office. Uh, I've been in touch with her chief of staff, uh, who is working with us to see if there's something they can do uh, you know, for the next draft. Good. Great. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for all you do. Thank you. I didn't see you in Cape Cod this year, Jason. <laughs> we usually run into each other, but yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. The next up, uh, the, the the Arts Council uh, is going to make us famous. We're going to be the rivals of Khan. We're going to have a film festival, and would the Arts Council folks like to take the mic and? Uh, Um, so, Marina Kiriakou, Matt Sullivan, um, we are collaborating together, as most of you know, uh, proposing this art uh, film festival for the Marinette. And the dates are April 12th, 13th, and 14th, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday coming up in 2024. Um, Matt and I are going to talk a little bit about the vision for this. and. Um, each one of you has a perspective, a little um, pamphlet on your desk. And I'm sure that moving forward, you are going to come up with questions. And, and we too have some questions that I've already been in discussion with Dan and um, Nora and, uh, and our attorney trying to put this infrastructure together of what this thing looks like. Um, but for now, we just wanted to give you an introduction. And um, some of our thinking behind this, one of, one of the things is that we, we didn't feel that we just wanted to offer our residents, our community, more entertainment. I think it's, um, most of us can agree that there are a lot of films out there. There's the cinema, there's the Emelin, there, there's so much competing for our attention. But we see this as an opportunity to really do something for the village that can spark conversation, that can unify us, that can, you know, do some kind of spirit work in our community. And I, I think that's what we try to do at the Arts Council anyway, and this is what we're really up for. And um, that, that's what you guys do with um, LMC. And it, in our collaboration seems to make a lot of sense. Our core committee includes Carla Aver, and we also have a consultant. Carla's uh, a co-member of mine on the Arts Council. And we are also right now using a consultant who has a 17 year uh, tenure at Jacob Burns. He's no longer there. He's doing his own work in the film industry, but uh, his name is Sean Weiner. He's been really helpful to us to getting us started and really understanding like how do you put legitimate, robust film festival together. So we, we are feeling pretty well prepared. We've put our vision together and that's before you. We've put a budget together. We've thought about sponsorships. We, we've thought about what it looks like to get the whole community involved. Um, it, it really takes the whole village to make something like this happen, from government to our community organizations, at least this is how we see it, um, to the three venues, the Emelin, the cinemas, and the library. Um, we're also going to be looking at doing events at the restaurants and working with them, the different community organizations. We've already been in conversation with Tammy Burke. Um, yeah, so... I will just yeah. add the, uh, <clears throat> again, reiterate the community element of this, that this is a community-wide event that's uh, you know, aimed at bringing together our entire community, whether it's our business community, uh, our, our, our artists that we have, uh, residents, you know, it's an opportunity for everyone to get in the room, to see a film, to converse after that film, and really uplift the entire community behind something that uh, focuses on the human spirit. And that's really, I think, the impetus of this entire film festival when Marina and I started talking about this was to create uh, a platform through which everyone can, we can all uplift each other. Um, LMC's role in this, of course, with our uh, new studio on the Avenue attached to American Cinemas, we'd like that to be a little bit of an HQ. Um, in providing podcasting and you know getting talkbacks with directors, actors, producers of these films, and uh, I want to thank the Village Board for your support in this project, and also say that you know this is going to be 
a place for everyone from the community to come in for free, uh, residents, uh, to use this podcast facility. So we're really excited about opening that uh, later on this year. And I don't know if there's anything else you want to add. Um, I, I would just call out one of the pages in the presentation. Um, it's, it shows Michael J. Fox, the Michael J. Fox films, the documentary about him and, and his and different parties. And the way we envision this is, is we are scouting right now during the film festivals that are going on in the country. We are not, um, but we are in touch with people who are. And we are looking for films that resonate for different themes in our community. The themes could be environment, the themes could be um, accessibility and handicap, the theme could be um, Latino heritage. Um, but we, we use the example of Michael J. Fox documentary to show you how a presentation of a film could play out in terms of a community film festival. So let's say the feature film at the Emlyn, let's say, was the Michael J. Fox movie. It would not be that because we're looking to premiere new films for next year. Um, but that's an example of taking a theme that we think is a prominent for a theme in our community um, accessibility and and having um, Home on the Sound, different organization um, hosted, co-host this film before the film shows, then the film shows, and then after there would be a talk back with um, the director, maybe a, a person that's featured in the film, something like that. And then the next day there would be another opportunity, maybe at the library, to, to an extension of whatever that topic was, um, whether it's in a short form of conversation. So um, that's just an example. Anyway. Another note on the yeah. uh, curation, if I can add. Yeah, to that. So um, part of the festival would be curated by the film team. The other part of this, of course, would be submission-based. Submissions, we're looking at uh, submissions from local Hudson Valley filmmakers, as well as our student bodies, whether it's the high schools in the area or local colleges, that's also going to play a role in uh, the three-day festival. So then this page with uh, Michael J. Fox, that's all aspiration. Okay. So this is, not, when you say community, because I was, I, at first I was hearing like Mermanic community, and then in the later part I started hearing Westchester County community. Um, so is it both or is it more than the other? One is, one is more than the other. Are we focusing? Is it, do you mean in terms of the selection of films? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the selection of films, we would have uh, different blocks. So there would be feature film blocks, short film blocks. Uh, one of the short film blocks would be a Hudson Valley uh, film block. The other would be a student. Okay. And those would be open to, you know, uh, Hudson Valley students, Hudson Valley filmmakers. Yes, because I asked because I was thinking about the the, the themes, because even in like the uh, potential themes that you have down, um, are we are are did you base the potential themes based upon local issues or did meaning Mermanic local issues or did you base it upon Westchester County issues and then how did you come up with the themes and is was there a survey done where people were asked like what is important to them um because one thing i could think of it right now which is important to westchester county as a whole and just everywhere is um housing but also gentrification so that could be a really good theme to add to your potentials um agreed Bilani, and, and we've spoken about a lot of these things including infrastructure including um community involvement, you know, mm -hmm. um, community engagement. Um, th there, are, there are many themes that we're going to be out on the lookout for. So, so what, you see, what you are seeing here just, is kind of organic and it, a lot of it will be a result or what we choose will, will result from what we see out there and what films you know, resonate um, when we're looking at these films. And then, and then we're going to go back to the community and you know, see like, what's happening in the community, what organizations would support this, uh, what potential sponsors would support this as well. So. Yeah, I think the, the goal would be not to pigeonhole ourselves in one particular theme, but just say that, you know, obviously we'd like to keep themes that are that are important to our community. Oh, I thought all of them were part of the themes. I guess that when I was reading, I was like, you could possibly do all of them, just have different, right. uh, different, uh, uh, films that are 
based upon all the themes. You could just absolutely. I think it's going to be really about access to those films. What's coming out of uh, right. Sundance or what's being submitted uh, through our film freeway portal that we most likely use for, for submissions. So, thank you. Thank you. Sounds great. Yeah. Thanks for your support. Uh, yeah. What do you need? Is there anything you need right now, now from us? Like, uh, is this just informational, or is there an ask here? The only um, the ask that we're needing to work on is this fiscal infrastructure, and I, I don't know that this is the time to discuss that. But I, you know, that that's one of the links that we haven't put together because LMC and the Arts Council are the two entities that are that are uh, right. coordinating this whole festival on behalf of the village. Um, you know, so we're, we're going to need to discuss a bit of that. And um, so that's one thing. And the second thing would be parking. And and we'll discuss that, you know, with you, Jerry, everybody, uh, when the time we, got a lot we of approach. Um, yeah, <laughs> but, you know, we're thinking about trolleys from yeah. the harbor, that kind of thing, because we, we assume that yeah. we're going to have quite an influx Good. that weekend. So, you that's know, great idea. We, we're just trying to look up solutions, you know, right. uh, and that's what we'll be focusing on. But and so, I think it's fair to say that we've got some more work to do around um, the, the physical infrastructure of this thing so that we can get moving and we're relying on sponsorships. And uh, okay. thanks for your time. Appreciate Thank it. You very much, Thank Paul. you. All right. Uh, who else is left in the audience? Oh, God, I forgot something. Um, <laughs> Yeah, let's go back to the top of the agenda. Belief flow of law. Uh, what this would do is require all leaf flows in the village of Mamaronek to be electrical leaf flow, battery operated or electrical, uh, plug, plug in, uh, but no more uh, gasoline powered. Uh, I think uh, Largemont has done this. I was speaking to somebody from their uh, environmental committee the other day. Uh, my, my, my concern with it is the commencing. The commencing is uh, January 1st next year. And to me, that doesn't give people enough time to phase out their gas and get an electric. You know, if somebody just bought a, a, new, a new blower, you know, then they're gonna have to buy a new blower again next year. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, I, I know a lot of this is, Aimed at uh, aimed at the landscapers, but a lot of people in this community do their own lawn, and uh, you know. So I'm, I'm trying to give them some time. And I know uh, we had a program that offered an incentive, right? A hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, the end of, end of this month, I was waiting for the next environmental commission. Okay. Will, uh, so if we 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 will have a program, a limited program. Uh, to to allow people to for get residents. a was what for residents for, for residents for homeowners uh, to get a what, is it a hundred dollar rebate when they turn in there yeah it's a so maybe the program will be um, it's a hundred dollar voucher for the purchase of a an electric or battery operated leaf blower. Um, and the way you get the voucher is we'll have two dates that um, will both be Saturdays probably where you can return or you can turn in, trade in a piece of gas powered equipment. So it could be a hedge trimmer, it could be a lawnmower, it could be a leaf blower, and then we give you the voucher. And, and the, the voucher is good for any type of garden equipment that's electric or only leaf blowers? Leaf blowers. Only leaf blowers? It can be, we can expand it. That's why I needed to get to the next meeting. So we have to find yeah, out. I mean, it would seem like somebody might want to get an electric mower or an electric uh, edge trimmer. So the way I set it up with um, the two the two retail or wholesale uh, retail locations, they were leaf blowers. They weren't anything else. So that's the way I set it up with the those two entities that we talked about. Okay. We, can, we can talk about it a little more. I just don't know what's available. Uh, but uh, does anybody have a problem with changing the date for a year hence? I think we have to do an educational component around it. So I think we can't do it January 1st. I think that's way too soon. I think you're right. There has to be an education component. Um, so I, I'm happy to push it out. But I also think that we, re we removed 
I mean, there's been criticism that the people who are penalized by this typically are people who work for landscapers, not the landscaping companies. And we're removing the provision that says any violation issued under this subsection shall be issued to property owners, to the property owner or the owner of the business undertaking the leaf blowing operations at the discretion of the enforcement officer issuing the violation. So I'm not sure why we removed that sentence. What is the education component? And what does that look like? Well, I, well like what, I mean, we, what, we've, what have we done with other pieces that's an education component? Like, is this like a pamphlet that goes out to all the... So we recently mailed out 722 letters mm -hmm. to area landscapers, letting them know about our law. That's what we've done. How about the rest of the... But, but, but the law is the time frame of... We do door hangers. Mm -hmm. We do about 3,000 door hangers a year. But... We door to door. I mean, we can put them in... Th we can do it in the Friday newsletter. We oh, can yeah. do it's it. It's not in the Friday newsletter. It's yeah. Not. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's easy. Okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah. 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 So we, think we want to make the change of, of not starting in January 1st of 2024. Uh, I propose changes to 2025. So. Well, this is. Go ahead. Okay. This, this is not a new issue. I mean, this has been yeah. uh, um, uh, bubbling up for a while, and it's been been around. I mean, it should not be a surprise to anybody. If we're serious about this, we should uh, we should do it. And um, I think that we're we're offering people a way uh, to to comply. And uh, my criticism of the law itself, uh, the way it's written, is that it should be that we are banning. Uh, gas-powered leaf blowers, period. And uh, then the exception would be, um, then then we can get into electric blowers are are permitted in within the within the um, the, the constraints that are that are uh, listed below. But I think uh, I think we need to, uh, to move forward. I don't uh, I don't believe. I don't think I don't think it's fair to give people two months. No, I mean it, you, I don't think you might, you might say this. But we would, but the average person. Who owns a home, and especially if they're, they're they're a person that's doing their own gardening and maintaining their own home themselves, they're not paying attention to what we're talking about. Believe me, uh, you know, and I don't mean that in a in a, in a negative way, but they're, they're busy. They have lives. We, you know? So is that is that but are you so are you arguing the point that we need to have more education? Or no, I, I, like... no, we definitely need to have more education. I agree with Nora on that. Well, you but need I, more time. But I, but I also think we need to give people at least a year. To you know, make make that change. I, I think I I agree it needs to be further back from January first, but I think it's just it should be the date should be in twenty twenty four, but it should be the day so where it's prohibited. Where it's prohibited anyway. You're like, saying like it gives that it's going to give people May fifteenth. Yeah, it should be May fifteenth. It's going to give people two years anyway because they should be using it from May fifteenth to September thirtieth. So that gives them all the way until October first of 20, a, a year from essentially now to get an electric leaf blower. I mean, if somebody has just purchased a gasoline leaf blower, they're going to be understandably frustrated. Yeah. And, and, and especially it's more, it's more aggressive on people who do their own lawns because they are the people who, you know, all have their own, may, maybe all have their own leaf blower. We rake. But I think that they should be May 15th of 2024. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't push it back to 2025. Yeah. Question. <laughs> Okay. Sorry, I was trying to get it in. But um, to Nora's point, is there a reason why we etched out the um, the uh, the the fines will be um, the sanction will be be given to the property owner um, or the owner of the business? Is there a reason why that was kind of xed out? Try to um, try to find where you. Um, it's. Uh, the first page, um, right above, of, like it was the whole big chunk of um, the the strike the the, the last sentence, the last of the strike sentence. Out. yeah, the strikeout. Thank you. Right before our leaf blowers, it's just the one. So, so that the uh, the guy who's just working on the truck isn't getting the ticket. Uh, Criminalize something. Criminalize conduct. Conduct? Conduct. 
concern that if you're saying the person who owns the property is guilty, the person who owns the property is not the person yielding the leaflet, you're you may be making the law enforcement based against at least in the situation where there's some doubt. Who's that fault? Who has I'm trying to I'm trying to this day because I'm trying not to use a Latin word that lawyers know, but that uh, non-lawyers will not know or mens rea. Okay, it means intent. Yes. Uh, so the homeowner who hired a landscaping company, for example, mm -hmm. uh, shouldn't I mean I, I guess theoretically we could penalize that homeowner at the landscaping company. No, I get it. I get what you're saying. That's, but, that's my concern. So now with the law that we're proposing that, that's proposed right in front of us, is it that it's open to any person that we see with a a guest leaf blower? I, any person who uses a guest leaf blower after whatever date you decide is violating the law. So you're saying the other the, the other provision was unenforceable. The provision so now, now but now I'm concerned. I mean, I, but the problem in cases in which it was enforced because people didn't raise the issue. So, uh, but then now, any person who has a leaf blower and they're holding it in their hand and they're using it illegally, they can they can get the ticket when it not necessarily was them who made the decision to use it. Maybe it was their boss, but you're giving now out this ticket to the individual who's holding it. Now they have to pay that. That's right. Yeah. But what happened? I, I, I don't know, but to me, there's a I, there's a little bit we're talking so, about criminalization. We had some correspondence on this. I'm not sure if Bob was copied, and uh, I I don't have I don't my computer's not working, so I don't have some things I'd saved on it. Where there's no it says it, the, our, our, the code mentioned something about a repeat, but there are they don't keep those kinds of records because it wasn't considered to be criminal. So, I, I'm just can I I I feel like it's it it's not fair for an employee who is told they have to use a leaf blower to get a ticket for a decision that they didn't make that their employer or the or the person who owns the house that their employer is working for. Um, we can look at that and see yeah. if there's a way to wrap that. I mean, I understand where you're, I understand yeah. you're concerned. And I mean, and all, what I mean, the only thing that this law does is. It swaps out, it requires electric when we're allowing people to use leaf blowers. So it eliminates the gasoline, which is the noisier. It doesn't help with all the particle particulate matter because leaf blowers are, have other adverse environmental impacts. It doesn't help with that. Um, and it doesn't help the village enforce, you know, we still have a situation where people use leaf blowers when they're not supposed to. They'll just be in this case, they'll just have to use quiet early flowers when they're not supposed to. But it doesn't it it doesn't make it any easier for the village to enforce, enforce the law. And um, and I think it it's kind of regressive to the people who are actually the people using the leaf blowers. We we had a uh, um, uh, enforcement blitz recently. Yep. All right. Uh, tell us mm -hmm. how that went. And uh, and who got the tickets? We need another mic. We used to have two. There's be one each. Also, oh, you got another mic. Batteries. So during a week, um, where police department, building department, and the manager's office went out, and um, the leaf blower blitz, we um, we issued violations to 31 individuals, landscapers employees and or their bosses um, or the owner of the uh, Typically we issue about 90 violations a year. So in one week we did about a third of what we normally do in a year. And um, some of them wanted to use their leaf blower when they got caught, their electric leaf blower when they got caught with their gas leaf blower because they have both in their truck. <laughs> and I said that our law doesn't allow that. They don't allow leaf blowers at all. But for the ones that I wrote up, maybe a dozen or so, a little less, 
about half of them had electric leaf blowers in their vehicles because they must work in other communities where only electric leaf blowers are permitted. So it's not that they're not geared up towards it. Um, when we wrote up the, um, the individual, the affidavits that I, that I filled out, they were for the business. We issued the violation to the business, not to the employee, not to John Smith or Gary Barber, we, we, we issued it to the, to the business. And the owners, in my and I think, right, mm -hmm. the owners were here in court when they all pled guilty to using the legal. Okay, so in, in practice, we're, 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 we're violating the right people. Yeah, we're violating mm -hmm. the ones, and the it, companies and that are using it. And it doesn't go to somebody's individual it's record. Been going it's not like a parking, a speeding no, ticket or unless something. Unless the individual is a single, Sing, you know, a sole proprietorship, you know, one employee business, it's going to the owner of the business. Of, of the people you ticketed at that, and you said some of them had electric blowers, you, how many of those people did you ticket that had it in their truck, but were using a gas? Would you say all of them, or would you say five out of the 10? Yeah. So, yeah. I, so I just think that these people, their are landscapes that are coming in, but they already know this. Like you said, they're probably doing it using an electric somewhere yeah, two, else. Two or three of them went into their truck and said, can I use this? And I said, no, you can't even use that. Yeah. But I just think exactly. they already have the equipment. It seems like, I don't know. Yeah. People have the equipment. They do have the equipment and homeowners. I mean, I'm on my second leaf electric battery car leaf blower. I've been using it for four or five years now. It, it, it's not a new issue. I mean, I remember uh, it's been an issue along the South Shore and into into Connecticut and Fairfield County for the um, best part of a decade. And uh, um, mostly with, started with the noise and uh, then the environmental uh, concerns became uh, more uh, front and center. I don't think this is uh, anything that should surprise anyone. And I think any someone who bought a gas-powered leaf blower lately was just not paying attention to the world around them. I mean, I don't, I don't know what what else to say. We we don't travel in the same world. Well, you know, it, I mean, it it, it 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 it's it's not just us. In other words, we're even a little late to this. I mean, you know, but uh, so it's been it, it's been a controversy and a push to limit them for uh, for for many years. Yeah, the, the village of America was one of the first communities to have uh, any control on leaf blowers. So it isn't. It isn't like you know we're 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 that uh, behind that curve. And I understand what you're saying. I'm just you know I, I did my own lawn poorly, but I did my own lawn for uh, a number of years. And you know if I hadn't been a trustee or or, or had been involved, that I don't know if I'd be paying attention to you know what, what's what's the uh, what's the future of leaf blowing. Well, why, why don't why don't we? Um, uh... Move it forward and see uh, if if uh, if there are complaints from people. I mean, we, this may be an imaginary uh, um, problem we're making up uh, that somebody just bought a leaf blower and they're going to be uh, disappointed. I don't know that anybody uh, would have done that. Um, okay. I agree. I, think, I mean, K KRB. You, you go to some of these places. Most places don't even sell them anymore. You have to really look for them to buy them. They're not. They're not. They're not. They're not the uh, state of the art uh, equipment anymore. I agree. I, I think of an anachronism. I think we all agree that the date should not be January 2024. I think that's. Oh, what I was going to all agree. Thing, but... well, <laughs> actually, whether it's January 20, 2020, whether it's January or whether it's May 15th, it's the same thing because you're not allowed to use them until May 15th. So it doesn't right. matter what, you know, exactly. it's still, but I'm still, I'm still, I'm, I'm still confused about, and I'm that, but Bob's saying that it might be criminal and that's why we have to give it to the person using it, not to the property owner. But, I, I agree. But, I think that but I'm also hearing that it doesn't, it's not associated with that name. So that, that doesn't seem, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, that there's a yeah. dichotomy. You know what, I, but, I, but I also, oh, sorry. but, but I also think that, you know, as a property owner, if you know that you're not supposed to be using it, you're going to you ask know. your landscaper not to use yeah. it. And you're going to ask um, you, you have, or your landscaper who knows that they shouldn't be using it, won't use it. And I think that it's that the, um, that the property owner and the owner of the landscape companies have more agency than the individual employee. And I just feel like we're, we're mm -hmm. making it harder on yeah. somebody who's just trying to do a hard job for a living. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, you know, but, you know, I, and I understand the impetus and now I know a little more Latin, uh, the mens re uh, about, 
you know, as a lawyer, I understand why you did that. But in practicality, I don't think it's ever been, you know what I mean? So if, if I, I think, you know, we leave it in there and, uh, you know, no one's taking this to. Uh... Wait, the people are gonna get mad. Let them get mad. I'm sorry. I was gonna say if 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 the homeowners end up getting the ticket, then they have to really think about their the people who are mowing the businesses that are mowing their lawn and really put um and put the responsibility on them or just get somebody else because at the end of the day, it's about accountability. Yeah. But I don't think it's the accountability on. The on the individual worker, gentleman or worker. woman who's yeah. Yeah, hired I, I, usually yeah. is a day but I don't think if it, that that was ever the case that we were ticketing. Uh, you know, I, the, I understand where the the board unanimously wants to go, and I'll be happy to redraft the law <laughs> in that okay. go in that direction. Okay. But I would prefer to discuss my Reasons. legal advice. Okay. In an advice of counsel session later. Okay. okay. Fair enough. Rather than create all sorts of issues that we're going to have to deal with down the road, publicize all sorts of issues and, and, we're going to have to deal with down the road. And, and I would like that this this law um, not bury the lead, as we used to say in the business, and say gas leaf gas leaf blower banned. They're banned. They're banned. They're not permitted in 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 in, in um, Marinac under any way, shape, or form. You can't use them. They, you, you can't you can't crack them up if you own them. They don't, then they're, they're forbidden. And if we start with that and, and then everything underneath, you know, then then we will allow these other issues. I think that's the way to, to, to go with this, uh, that, that we're banning these devices, these, 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 uh, these gas powered uh, devices that spew uh, um, uh, fumes and uh, particulates into the air and, and make a lot of noise that they're now, they're, they're now illegal. But that's not true. So because we're allowing we're allowing electric ones and they they do the same well, thing. No, no, but we start with the gas gas we're banning gas powered leaf blowers. No, no. Um, 15 24 Well, well oh. however it is that it, well, that he, be he, the he first want, thing he wants I want simplicity in the, in the so language. Where Right now, we're banned from using them, from using any leaf blowers until May the 15th. So in a way, this is not a crucial law. We have a little while to get this correct. There's it more pressing be, issues no, than the... It's the October 1st. Starting October 1st, we can use it. Use it. Right. Exactly. So, so we should start May but, 15th because that's a day when you're not allowed to use it. So that's, technically, day, right. that's technically the big... That technically would give people until what Palmer would believe, but, which should be 2025. But we're not going to enforce it as but we're not going to be enforcing it in september even if we adopted this law no this the earliest date is january 2024 and it might be the next year yeah. so you won't, be, you won't be enforcing it in september no. if you schedule a public hearing right on the 25th right even if you adopt you and, and you're not going to do that because now doing a new version right you're not going to adopt until october right anyway. okay okay so, so with, with 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 the change of date and with the uh, change of uh, the other thing that you're going to talk to us about, and with you know Lou's headline, can can you redo it? Yeah. And meanwhile, just, just to be clear, if, if we whether you make it effective May 15th or September, it's not going to effect until September. It's October 1st, mm -hmm. 2020. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So, exactly. but maybe with the committee for the environment having a, at least a representative here and a liaison, we can talk it up a little bit in our newsletter and talk about what the village is going to do so that it won't be a surprise. Okay. I mean, since since uh, the, the chair of the of the committee is here, do you, you want to say something? Do you want to weigh in on this thing? Yeah. Um, go go to Mike, please, Dave. Yeah, yes, please. Uh, go to podium. This is a pretty complicated issue, obviously, and pretty controversial. We actually have a, a, a subcommittee on the Committee for the Environment that's looking at the issue. One of the things that is particularly uh, tricky is that we have three municipalities, each of whom has a different law. And one of the things that we are trying 
to get a handle on is um, going to make the laws similar across the municipalities because that's going to help with enforcement. Mm -hmm. Landscape or say, well, I don't know what to do in the village because it's different from the town, it's different from the, uh, the village of Larchmore. And so there will be some benefit in as you consider what you're going to do, try to take try to work with the other municipalities so that there's one law that applies in the three jurisdictions. I think that this will if, if if we make this change, I know it'll bring us in line with Larchmont. Um, I'm not Larchmont sure. bans all all of them, doesn't it? No, I think they just uh, they, I don't think they bend all. Do you know Larchmont, as I understand it, basically bans all gas mm -hmm. and yeah. it has an electric all exception. Ah, oh, for six weeks in the, mm -hmm. in the spring yeah. and two months in the fall. All right, yeah. So we'd be in line with them pretty much in some mm -hmm. aspect, yeah. Closer to. I don't know what the town is usually. Been, been okay. The town. Yeah, the town is always a little far Bans since I left. Yes. Uh, you can use an electric blower anytime in the town, as I understand. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no restriction. Uh, gas is banned during the summer. And that was, and uh, that that unrestricted um, electric blower provision was pretty soundly rejected. By the committee, I, if I recall correctly, I think the committee, if, if we didn't take a vote because we're still studying, and we got a, a very impressive presentation by the chair of the village of Larchmont's committee, uh, and and they've gotten themselves convinced and have convinced the village that all eventually we should do away with blowers entirely. That's a whole other discussion, and it's going to take some education and some yeah. thinking about it. Um, that's something that we can be thinking about in the long term, but certainly banning gas blowers immediately and, and having a limited ability to use electric blowers is something this that's is a really good, good first step. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, David. Got it taken. Okay. So, Bob, I think you know where you we're going, right? I hope you married me, sir. Wow. <laughs> okay. He smiled. Uh, okay, let, let, let's move with some rapidity here. Uh, 1D, amending fee schedule as it relates to certain building and planning fees. Uh, this is on for regular, too, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. We've discussed it before. Uh, they, they have the final law. They, they, they really feel like this is something that has to happen. Uh, soon, uh, what 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 this really does? It it makes the system, in my view, more equitable for the person who's applying for a building permit. If they don't get the building permit, it, we're not keeping their money. In, in some and substance, that, that that's what this is. Right now, there's no mechanism to refund that money. So, you know that that doesn't seem quite fair. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any anything you want to add? Could you, could you, could you, since Carolina Fonseca, a building uh, inspector? You're on. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so basically, what is that is exactly correct. Right now, there are no vehicles for us to exempt anybody um, from including for anybody applying for projects that will require reuse board. And also, whenever someone comes to the office and requests a refund, there's nothing in the code currently that allows us to go ahead and issue the refund. We do all our best with what we can, but right now there's nothing in the code, so this is really important. Yeah. This might be a men's ray issue that we're stealing their money. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's a, I don't know how it worked more. And it's, it's always been the case? Yes. Right. But, well, there's always, that's what we explain to the community, there's always legislation behind our actions. Mm -hmm. When we don't have the legislation, it's really something we cannot enforce. Right? Right. It's basically, that's what we try to do, to translate whatever is in the code uh, into action. So we need to fix this. Okay. Correct. All right. 
And I think there's one provision of, there's a conflicting provision of the code. But so as I understand it, what we're changing now is um, that we are initiating a $150 fee for initial review fee. So we're initiating a new fee of $150. And that's what people pay for when they file for a building permit application. And then we're also raising a bunch of fees. So like um, we're making the residential permit fee high. Every fee is also going up a bit. So can I just address mm -hmm. that? The problem that Carolina talked about, which is, as you're right, the trustee Lucas, it, it is a conflict in the code. And, and there is certainly no authority for refunding money that has been collected mm -hmm. already. It prompted an entire review of the process and the fees and the ability to monitor applications through the new computer system that the building department is using. So the building inspector and the planning director went through the process and have developed a process by which now there's an application fee, there's an initial fee that pays for the building inspector and the planning director to look at the application and see what, what it needs. If it requires board approvals, it goes one track where they pay for those board approvals. Right. If it doesn't require any board approvals, it goes right to building permit and the entire building permit has to be paid mm -hmm. before the building perm permit application is reviewed. If it goes the board route, the applying for the building permit, which by the way is the largest fee, it's a percentage of the construction costs, mm -hmm. that uh, doesn't, isn't required to be paid until after the approvals are obtained. So that if they're never obtained, you don't. And, and the construction, the building construction plan review is never done, you don't pay for it. Residents and, and others don't have to pay for something that isn't done. Right. That, but so it wasn't just changing one or two fees, it was a comprehensive review that resulted in this schedule. And right. so and the, and the initial fee, the $150, is not refundable because that's the application fee. And because the work is being done, they're right. reviewing it, it to see what, what, it, what it requires. Got it. And so then, mm. so there are other things are going up incrementally, incrementally, but, and there's a few fees that are being added are fees for inspections, which did, did we, I don't know if we, did we not charge for inspections before? Right. Okay, so now we're charging. things also, there are a few board applications for which there were no fees in the code. Mm -hmm. And those are, those were in here as well. But I don't, administrative fee. okay, I don't, I didn't, I mean, I did, I tried to do a comparison and I didn't see those. So what happens when you apply for, um, your plumbing permit and for your electrical permit. Those are different. Those those are different permits and those are different fees as well. Right. But when you're calculating based on the value of the construction, are you calculating based on the cost of plumbing and um, electric too, or just yes. the yeah? So that's right. So basically, the fees that are here, which is mm -hmm. addressing just you look like your plumbing, more change back in April. So right now the only change is it correct this correct everything is the one hundred and fifty everything else we know is the same. So, well, you know, it may not have caught up in the code. I was looking at the code, and if oh. the code book hasn't been updated, then because we did, we did before the budget hit, we it raised some of those. Yeah, yeah, general code updates for twice a year. Yeah, yeah, trust trustee Lucas. General code updates the online version twice a year. Okay, okay. So I was looking at the 2020 fees. Okay, so we're not up. So they're not. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you. So everything else, I was looking through it. It did remain the same. Okay. So what, going back to what you were saying, um, the electric permit has a total estimated cost, uh -huh. which is the market value of that cost. Same thing from the plumbing uh, cost, and those numbers should be deducted from the from, uh, for, from the building. It should be deducted from the building permit exactly. because they don't get spec'd out till later. Correct. So you're not double counting. Yeah. Well, okay. That and I think that's that's I think that's an important factor. Okay. Correct. Thank you. And then the other thing that we were talking about is how do we how do we pay people how do we reimburse people who have been in the event that somebody's applied for a permit, gone through, paid a big permit fee. I don't know if there's anybody who's done this, but Greg indicated there might be. You know, they're they've paid a big fee to the village, and they're not going to get their variance, or they're not going to get their approval. Section, section thirteen. So section 13 says mm -hmm. that after six months, after six months, um, 
individual that's what fees yeah. pay within the last six months. Within the last six months that um, they can um, they can petition the village clerk, the village clerk can petition me and the village clerk will refund them the building permit application fees. And that's retroactive. So that's yeah. for somebody who's already paid months. the fee. For six months. Okay, six, six months, months from when we did Okay, thanks. Those are my questions. That was a little confusing. This is, a, this is a good fix though. It is, and it's, it's, it's equitable. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, everybody fine with uh, moving this along? Yes, yes. All right, and, great, thank you, Carolyn. And it's on for tonight to schedule a public hearing for two weeks. Yes, yeah. that's what I mean. Uh, Mem's presentation we did, Arts Council we did, Flood Mitigation Advisory Committee, a resolution to study upstream detention options. Uh, let me just get this out. Uh, this is matter to see. Uh, they have a resolution here, authorize the village manager to partner with Westchester County to seek funds for an engineering assessment of potential detention and retention sites for stormwater throughout the Mimaric, Sheldrick, and Beaver Swamp watersheds, including, but not limited to, the Mimaric Reservoir, Saxon Woods Park, Silver Lake, and any and all areas where stormwater could be detained or retained. In discussion with SLR, SLR did not study retention, detention. SLR is a, a consultant that uh, the, the state hired, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and do not have this in the scope of the watershed study they were completing. Uh, this, is, this seems like a good idea. Uh, the only thing that I would want to add to it uh, is that you know we make sure that it, it's explicit that Westchester County has to work in tandem with the upstream com upstream communities. Uh, you know, we, we could be involved, but you know they're not going to listen to us unless there's a in, 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 to be. Uh, Frank, a bigger dog uh, that they <laughs> that they are going to need later on. Uh, they have been uh, they have been pouring their stormwater down to us now for hundreds of years, and in their view, it works very well. <laughs> they used to. Uh, so you know, we, we need Westchester County, which hopefully could have a crudgel uh, over these communities uh, to get them to cooperate more. So I, I just want to make sure that you know. We, we, uh, that we're we're partnering with Westchester County, but Westchester County has to be really the lead on this. So that will be up to us to sit there and talk to county legislators and and, and, and the county executive yes. to. Okay, so I just want to know who's who's the ass and who's asking who needs to ask because I know that the flood committee often says that this is something that we need to do and these things I have been trying not having the great success yeah. at it, but for members who've been here a little longer. <laughs> you know, I'm, I, I think that we should take this resolution, uh, have our friend, Mr. Sonoff down there, uh, work his magic and uh, kind of, he's, he's a he's a aspiring poet and uh, add more clearly that uh, Westchester County has to be, you know, the prime mover here. I said, Mayor, I, I only write resolutions to live up to the standard of your poetry and prose of your proclamations. <laughs> okay. Mayor. <laughs> yes. I think Dan has some information as far as the contribution of Silver Lake and other upstream. Yeah. Well, we, uh, the, the Army Corps, they didn't look at upstream detention either, but they, they did make some notes in their report back in 2016. Um, Silver Lake uh, is basically at the top of the watershed. 96% yeah. of the watershed lies below Silver Lake. So uh, an area like that is probably not going to be uh, suitable for any real detention. Um, I, I think same, same thing probably maybe with Maple Moor. Uh, so much of the watershed lies below that, that it may not provide the greatest benefit. Well, but if, 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 if the water that, that hits that uh, those golf courses stay on those golf courses, doesn't that help us? It makes them attractive water hazards. I, I could yeah. deal with that. <laughs> I can't I'd, ra I'd rather have the water hazard at Maple Moor and Silver Lake than in somebody's basement yeah. on Madison Street. I mean, so let, 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 let's let them figure out 
what, what can and can't be done. And I appreciate your 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 vast encyclopedic knowledge, but uh, you know, let, let's not give them an out before we give them an in. So is everybody fine with that? Yes. And so we'll have it on the agenda in two weeks to vote as a board. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to our friends at FEMAC for bringing us forward. Okay, uh, now we have Gino, uh, the engineer assessment of the Marinic Reservoir Dam. Walk us through this, Gino. Well, well, Gino's getting ready. The the Mamaronic Dam at the Westchester Joint Waterworks uh, it was originally built uh, as a dam for a reservoir when it was a reservoir there uh, that supplied the drinking water to this community and other communities. That has long since been phased out, and we now uh, get our drinking water from the New York City supply. Uh, that dam. Uh, was was uh, fitted with uh, two sluice gates uh, to allow the water to flow through to kind of mimic uh, the flow of a river. Uh, and it has been deteriorating over time. So we have to take some action eventually. Uh, and they are the, the, what our questions are really the, the, the value of flood retention of that dam. Right. Uh, do you so based on a uh, recent engineering assessment that was completed by our consultant GHP, the uh, Mamaronic Reservoir Dam was found to be in a, uh, an unsound condition and uh, out of compliance with current safety standards. Uh, some of the major issues with that assessment was inadequate spillway capacity. The spillway needs to pass the spillway design flood, which in this case is a half probable maximum flood. Uh, in addition, we had cracks observed along the upstream and downstream faces of the concrete buttress of the dam, uh, spalling of deteriorated concrete along the upstream faces of the, of the spillway, uh, missing flash boards, and uh, vegetative growth not only on the dam but uh, across the right and left buttons. So based on GHD's engineering assessment, I asked them to provide us with a memorandum outlining some options for us to bring the dam into compliance. Uh, in their March 13th memo, uh, it, was, it was brief, but I've asked them to recently uh, enhance it to include some costs and timelines for these options. Some of the options are including an application to the New York State EEC for the variants. That would basically uh, institute a routing program uh, where the abutments would be uh, solidified and fortified to uh, assist with the passing of floodwaters over the dam. Uh, this alternative may be that could be the most cost effective, but it's not guaranteed or possibly maybe not likely that the DEC would grant us the variance. Uh, a conceptual alternative to presented uh, an option to excuse me, increase the spillway capacity uh, by adding a new uh, auxiliary spillway that would be suitable to pass the spillway design flood. Uh, this option is approximately $6 million, a little over $6 million, and could take between four and a half to five years. Uh, permitting, engineering analysis, uh, secret determinations would be required. I, I'd like to mention, though, that in addition to the $6.3 million estimated cost, that the structure itself is over 100 years old. It's never really been probed or looked at in detail. So there's a potential here for this cost to increase. As we start peeling that onion, you could encounter additional uh, problems that need to be fortified or reinforced to bring this into compliance. Is it reinforced concrete? It's uh, it's partially pretty yeah, reinforced concrete. It's like uh, concrete panels. Okay. So the conceptual alternative three would be the removal of the existing dam and a new dam to be put in its place. Uh, similar type of timeline, uh, similar type of studies, secret determinations, land acquisition would need to be uh, uh, put on here. 
at a cost based on uh, around ten million dollars. Um, and the final alternative would be for a removal or decommissioning of the existing dam, similar time frame three three and a half to four years at a cost of three point three million dollars. Uh, I I want to note that uh, that three million dollars could be reduced. There is federal money. There is New York State DC money out there to assist us with the decommissioning. Most of the dams in this country were built between the 20s, 30s, and 40s with an anticipated design life of 80 to 100 years. Most of these are now at the end of their or beyond their design life, just like our dam. Uh, so the, the government and the state is eager to uh, decommission some of these that are like ours not really serving its intended purpose. Three point three million to remove a dam. Right, you, need, you wow. need to build, in order to do this, you need to keep the river flowing. So you need to construct a buffer dam or uh, a route for the river. And so then so you, gotta, you gotta circumvent the dam. Correct, correct. Uh, and then there, you'd have to have some environmental studies. Um, and then you'd have to build back a series of weirs and check dams to keep the elevation coming down and keep the river flow. Uh, but again, like I said, they're, they're this, I'm not sure exactly how much, but there could be a substantial portion of this covered by, by grants. Uh, I, I, I also had the opportunity to uh, review and uh, read um, several reports, two by the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, written in 1977 and 1981, uh, a uh, Stearns and Wheeler report in 2005, and a Hayes and Sawyer report written in 1977, when they had done all hydraulic studies of the dam, structural studies of the dam. And they've all reached the same conclusion. The dam provides minimal flood protection from between a one to a two year storm. Uh, one report, the most recent, the Stearns and Wheeler report, did actually go out and say that it was a three year storm. Basically, what that means is once you've exceeded that storm event, it's as if the dam wasn't even there. Uh, so for our most serious flooding, I'm hearing that the dam is not as useless? Pretty much. It's basically once the dam crests and the water flows over the flashboards, it becomes basically bumping the, bump the river. Like it's not even there. Provides minimal protection for between a one to a two, one to a three year storm or provide some flood protection. And one to a three year storm is like what, a two, two inch rain or? Yeah, approximately. Uh, I'd, I'd have to get back to the neighborhood. Like the events we've had recently. Right? Like the events we've had recently. Yeah, they're, they're very so, frequent events. So, you know, I think yeah, in terms, in terms of the right. one to the three year storm, Sorry? Um, there's calculations for what that impact is at the confluence, correct? Yes. Uh, the most recent uh, GHD report. Uh, concluded that with the dam at the confluence, uh, without the dam, there would be a, a approximately 0.43 foot increase in water level, about five inches. At the two year storm, there would be a tenth of a foot, approximately one inch increase at the confluence. After that five year storm, it doesn't make a difference if the dam is there or not. There's effectively no assistance. So, so in other words, the, the river would be a little deeper. For a one to two year storm, yeah, if the dam wasn't there, but, but it, again, the only <laughs> inches is not enough to overtop the banks of the Mamaroneck River at the core of the Shell River with that confluence. Well, I mean, and, the reason the dam is still there is because people have believed for for years that it that it helps in some way. Uh, uh, is this if it were removed? Is this would we need to do something to the river to 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 um, to make up for that? I mean, uh, uh, widen it? Uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, there, there, well, over, over the years, uh, there's been limited maintenance done, so we have to cut down trees, remove the silt that's built up, and bring it back to a, a more natural water course uh, with a series of also some 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 weirs and check dams to bring down the, the elevation. Uh, but that could provide some assistance widening up banks, reinforcing them as well. But as part of any decommissioning, you have to identify what existing flood mitigation benefits are provided. Mm -hmm. And you have to incorporate and implement capital projects to maintain those 
benefits. So, and that's not included in the estimate for decommissioning, or is it? Sorry. Mm -hmm. So does the estimate for decommissioning <laughs> include maintaining the same degree of flood mitigation that the current dam, the dam currently provides the in whole, those smaller storms? I think that what they were, you're talking more about the regulatory issues that need yeah. to be done. So Dan was referring to if the dam is here uh, every two years, it needs to have uh, an inspection. You have to maintain the emergency action plan here where you have to uh, follow the uh, the IM report, and then and every ten years it has to have a major engineering assessment report that like was just done. So all those costs together, mm -hmm. I mean, it could could roughly cost me about eighty to one hundred thousand dollars per year yeah. on a structure that's old. Let me. There's a couple of things. Uh, first of all, there's a matter I want to discuss about this in advice of council. So remind me when we go in there. Uh, and second of all, like the I, alternative two and three, increase spillway length and, re, and dam replacement to maintain existing level of service. Do we have any idea of the impact? If, if we chose those routes, I, I'd like to know the impact on flooding. And, and, and sorry, and while you're answering that, because it has a, something to do with this question, is the impact on other neighboring um, commun communities, because I was reading in it that um, if if we do number two, um, that there will be some impact on their flooding and, and um, upstream neighborhoods. So I that, that is correct. So option two and three would each require land acquisition because you would further inundate lands above us. And from whom do we have to acquire the land? Uh, I believe, uh, I think it's the town of Harrison mm -hmm. is adjacent to it. It's, it's, not, the, it's not the waterworks property, it's town of Harrison's no, it's property. Town of Harrison. Okay. So, okay. Mayor, no, to answer your question, the new dam right now is to be replaced at the same crest elevation as the existing. So we can look into studies to further increase uh, the dam elevation, crest elevation, a couple of feet, and that would require some additional land acquisition, possibly some further inundation upstream. Um, but there is a limit. And uh, at, at one point, you will begin flooding the Marin Avenue. You know, obviously, there's a fixed elevation at that bridge. You start raising the crest of the dam above that, it's going to inundate the Marin Avenue. And Harrison. And in I believe that's Sid Harrison, correct, over the bridge. Is there um, a, is there a scenario where you could uh, increase the height of the dam and deepen the reservoir? Uh, deepening the reservoir uh, won't provide any additional flood storage. It's good if you have a water retention dam, like a drinking water, you yeah. get additional volume, but it won't provide any additional flood protection. You have to go above that natural level like we are now. Uh, I mean, typically, you know, why, why you see dams, oh, part of the, the Fort Reservoir system in Northern Westchester is because they take advantage of the topography. They're built in valleys. Uh, what you'd have to do in the down, down state, down county is build a bathtub, not, not, a, not a dam. You, you, have not, you have no natural topography within which water can be stored. But when you look at flood retention structures, but like Dan said, these structures are built in very, very clean gorgeous so they're 50 60 feet tall and they have the uh the retention capacity to hold back 100 year plus storms uh without inundating any you know homes or you know things like that we at this point our land behind there is generally flat and it's just not built we don't have that valley to retain this the, the flood water of 100 years so can, can I can I ask uh, can we can we get more information on like kind of informally with DEC about uh, the chances for the variance on Article Alternative One before we you know just 
Yeah. Before we throw money at it, can we have a conversation with them? Because you know how cooperative they can be. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can have a conversation with the DEC as well as our consultant to see if we can get some additional uh, estimates for uh, that would entail uh, the grounding program would entail and, and armoring the, uh, the existing uh, embankment. I mean, this seems like just what we talked about previously by working with the county to get cooperation with upstream communities, in this case being Harrison. And I know that they, the sluices or those valves are covered now, right? They're not accessible. The low level outlet, as far as I understand, the valves have been removed and the low level outlet, which is pipe under the dam to drain it. I believe is uh, is not operable. So, so are is that some, uh, just just in terms of you know maintaining what we had in yeah. the seventies, for instance, is that something we could repair as part of um, the variance option? Like just uh, maintaining yes. it? Yes, we're sorry. allowed to close the gates. Sir, sorry, I don't, I don't think I, we're allowed to close the gates. We have the sluice gates open to permit water to right. flow through. Uh, I think that was one of the conditions when when yeah. So we, we, we can certainly uh, look to see what the DC would request. I'm just, I, I, it just seems like it, 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 back it or open up that low level outlet, put the appurtenances back to valve back and operate it. Uh, that would also enhance or increase the responsibilities of the INM. That valve would have to be exercised every every few months, open, closed, and kept clear. And because if we were to decommission the dam, there has to be, I mean, it, Obviously, that's. An, I mean, every one of these processes involves a seeker evaluation. Yes. You'd have to figure out what's going to happen with the water that it's holding. You can't just let that water go. So there'd have to be some alternative that main that mm -hmm. that, that held that water. So that's correct. Um, to to so that it, so that it provides the same mitigation, even if it's not a huge amount of mitigation, it needs to provide the same mitigation. That it provides now, we can't have we can't decommission it and have less mitigation. All right, but that will only go for that will only be for number four if we choose. Yeah, I'm just but I, but that that just wasn't that just wasn't mentioned. It seems like that's a pretty scary option. I mean, overall, this is to not have to not know what the alternate provision is. Sorry. There are four bad options. There, there are four tough options. And, and it's disappointing news because uh, uh, I and a lot of people had great hopes that we could uh, use that dam to some advantage for flood mitigation. Yeah, just, just uh, like I said, each one of these reports, and you know, I can make them available to you. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd like some more information. Yeah. And, and, and we need to be... Uh, I think we, we might we might want want uh, Gino to, to go, go to the flood, uh, the FMAC and and and, uh, and to talk nice. to us directly because they'll- They'll have plenty of questions. They'll have plenty of questions and, and, and rightfully so, because for a long time, the only reason that dam is still there is because people believed it helped with flood mitigation. And um, uh, and to, uh, to find out that it's essentially, you know, worthless, uh, well, it's, it's not- uh, It's not worthless. It provides, it provides a low level of mitigation so that yeah. It's well, not going to help. But it, it doesn't like provide either. possibly the type of mitigation that they thought they possibly yeah. it, thought. Right. It, it thought it did more than what it's actually. Yeah. yeah. In other words, yeah. it, 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 in another Ida, it, it might as well not have been there. No, but we're, but we're, but, but, but there are a lot of people who worry about rain, you know, on a, on a yeah. Like I might think, oh, good, I don't have to water my plants. Other people are thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's, I'm right. happy for that dam. There's everything's relative. Well, of course. So, um, you want us to talk to the DC about the potential for the variance. Right. And I want to talk to Bob about something else when we okay. go. Very good. Because we'll do that and then we'll we'll get back to you on that. Thank you. Thank you. So we've taken a few things out of order and I, I spy to people from the Ellens from the library. And I'm wondering yep. if we can uh, take we them were, out of order. We're adding I didn't see it on the library in the work session. session. It is on the work session. Is it? Where is it? No, I, I, did I added it. Oh, I was asked okay. to add it over the weekend. Okay, good, good, yeah. good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, is it online? Okay. Yeah, it's yeah. not on the printout. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's, let's take them out of order. Uh, 
How, how do you want to hear this? Jerry, you want to start this off with it or just? No. No. Um, but I will if you want me to. <laughs> yeah, I do. So, um, that should be. We're, we're, at, <laughs> we're at a point where <laughs> that's how it is, right? So, um, we're at a point where um, I believe the board members of the library, um, based on conversations we've had in the past, um, have the opportunity to make this board comfortable so that um, the board can consider the next disbursement, which is the $800,000 disbursement, and make them comfortable um, that there's some things changing at the library, that there's um, provisions in place where what happens won't happen again, and that as we assist them in um, getting their legs back, um, that you know, everybody's on the same page. That's really how I'm going to start. Saying. And uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't feel comfortable. Why don't you express um, uh, the? Uh, I, I think there's, there's a. I think the information we've gotten so far isn't um, isn't isn't sufficient for us to 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 have the reassurances we need. And and uh, I very much want um, uh, want assurances from our staff that uh, that uh, things are on the right track. And uh, I'm not getting that because uh, the, the information isn't available. So Augie prepared pretty detailed um, yeah. analysis. And if he can just summarize that real quick, real quickly, Paul, um, that would get us, I guess, this get this conversation rolling. Because I think that's what we really need to have is a conversation between the Ellens and the board. Or we, whenever you're ready, pal. You're on mute. Orgy's on mute. Uh, clear them out. I can't, I think. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, no, he has to unmute himself. I got it, I'm unmuted. So, there you go, it's been a long time, so. I'm very yeah. concerned. The, the financial statements we have, they're all a draft. There's no a final statements available, number one. The balance sheet that the orders do have doesn't balance. The revised budget they gave us is in deficit of 356,000. You know, we're talking two years, we don't have one audited number for two years. I'm, I'm, I, I, I wouldn't be able to get a loan from a bank with that. I mean, so I, I, I get, emailed the board my notes. I prepared a financial statement, which I gave to the manager. And at this point, the simple thing is that we don't have any ordered financials. For what so years? I go to the bank and getting a loan with no, no ordered financials. I think it's for year ending May 31st, 22 and May 31st, 2023. The other thing is we don't have projected budget for next year. And and, and the, the, frankly, the, the numbers I saw say that the, that the next budget uh, will have a minimal uh, reduction of 3%. And I'm like, <coughs> at least. At least 3%, at least yeah. Not, that's not minimal, that's at least. At least, but that's not much. Um, uh, um, I, uh, I, I'm not sure that, uh, that uh, the gravity of the situation is, uh, is, uh, is, is being appreciated. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, that, that's, just, that's just my feeling. I mean, I, 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 it's, I think we need, uh, we need eyes. Uh, in, uh, I think you need, we, you need our staff at your at your shoulder to uh, uh, to um, uh, to help with this, and because um, uh, I uh, it just it just doesn't seem like it, it like it's um, the proper assurances. Has There's the a lot of money here. Has the library seen all these concerns? I think last night at seven thirty. 
Uh, well, if you want to say anything about it. Did, did, doggy, would, did Doggy share something though with Jerry that didn't get in backup? Jerry? I don't know if it went into backup. So I, I don't think you guys. Yeah. You have it. I don't think it's a backup then. So and then, and then you Jen, have it. I sent it to Jen and Helen. Who was on vacation. Ellen, it was shown to Ellen. She's responding to it. So, well, so, so okay, here I, I can make I sure. can read it. Mayor, if you want me to real quick, yeah, it won't take long. Uh, the attached revised budget does not balance. It shows a net deficit of three hundred and fifty-six thousand. Mm -hmm. This was um, Augie. Augie was working on this um, during the mm -hmm. day and uh, sent it to us later on in the evening, mm -hmm. like at four fifty. Um, the financial statement attaches a draft uh, as of May twenty twenty two. I would not place heavy reliance on the draft statement because it's over a year old. The management comments as of May 2022 are not attached. The fund balance section of the balance sheet does not foot. It's off by $12,843, which is the non-spendable prepaid expenditure component from the balance, which needs to be added to the financial statement. Uh, they have a negative assigned fund balance. Um, Restricted and assigned fund balance exceeds the cash balance. $681,000 represents debt service owed to the village and $373,000 represent billing cost and tax certs. Naraki Smith, the forensic auditing firm's letter below indicates deficiencies in the internal controls. The deficiencies and remedies are not noted and there's no data uh, that has been provided for the year May, 2023. Right on. So I'll try to go in that order. Thanks. I've made notes. The revised budget shows a deficiency of 356000 It absolutely does. Uh -huh. I did that intentionally. I could have plugged the amount using monies from our bank account, but I was trying to show that we still needed to close that $356,000 gap. I could certainly restate that and plug it. Um, which leads into the 22 audit. The reason why we had to come to the village to begin with was because we were relying in prior years on reserve money that did not exist. So that's how we got into this mess. So I was trying not to do the same thing in the revised budget. You know, we have this deficiency, but I'm gonna kind of derail that in a moment, um, just for a moment. We, I've been tracking how we're saving money to shrink that deficiency. And so far, and it's the projection for the year, we have $207,000 against that 356. Um, that's based on two full-time resignations. We are, and one part-time resignation. We are going to be hiring one or two part-times to help fill that gap, but we're not doing full-time. That's saving us salary, payroll tax, pension, healthcare benefits. Um, we're spending less on the bookkeeper than had been budgeted. So that's saving us money. We've Between June and July, we've gotten $37,000 in donations and we have a pledge for a $50,000 donation. So all those things add up to $207,000, making the net deficiency 149,608. So we're shrinking it. Um, we do take this, I'm sorry, but we do take this very seriously. The things that Augie pointed out are 100% valid, but that was all prior to us learning what went on in the library and before we came to you. So it's the before and the after. Now we'll talk about the status of the audits. O'Connor Davies did conduct the 22 audit. Was, we have a draft audit, which was submitted. Um, and I believe that's one Augie's referring to, saying it's not final yet, which is true. O'Connor Davies was waiting for Naraki Smith to finish the forensic audit. So all of these things are kind of, unfortunately, serial events. Ellen and I had a conference call yesterday morning with both O'Connor Davies and Naraki Smith. We should get the representation management letter by the end of the week or early next week. But we were told that the 
draft audit that we have is not changing. So none of the information there will be any different. So what's been put in front of you stays the same. Uh, Naraki Smith highlighting lack of controls. We discussed that when we last spoke in May, on May 22nd, when um, we gave an update to the village. At the board meeting, a couple of days, the library board meeting, a couple of days later, we passed all the new financial controls. They went into effect immediately. They're posted on our website. Um, those controls were built based on discussions I had with Augie, with information from the New York State Controller's Office, recommendations from O'Connor Davies, as well as recommendations from Naraki Smith. And we have been monitoring them very closely. I'm probably in that business office more than they want to see me, but I go and I just show up and I question everything going on. Um, as far as the year end results, we have not started the year end 23 audit. Again, it's all a serial event. We needed to make sure that all the Journal entry issues that have been identified prior by both O'Connor Davies and Naraki Smith get cleaned up before we start the 2023 audit. But since those two pieces just finished, we're now confirming that cleanup is. Remind me again, what, what's your fiscal year? Is it January to December 31st? It's, it's, it's like us. Okay. It's, it's, it's been yours. Yep. And I'm sure you haven't done your, sorry, but your 23 audit either. So yeah, start um, this week. Where we are on this week, we're doing the audit. You are? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have a draft of our order already. Okay. Yep. But we will be starting it um, as soon as we get these other bits wrapped up. We don't want to delay this. We know it's critical. And I have started doing work on a draft budget for fiscal year 24 25. I've already identified more than 3% in cuts. Um, and when Jennifer is back from vacation next week, I am sitting with her for several hours, going through line by line, um, hopefully to shrink it more. We're all taking this very seriously. The, the, the next tranche of money that we talked about is, correct me if I'm wrong, basically to cover uh, the the bond that the village took out. And to keep our cash flow in a healthy situation until February's taxes. So we get the next February tax. In reality, and I probably shouldn't say this, so I'm new to me, Alan. Um, in reality, we do not really need the full 850,000 now. That could be reduced. However, if there was some catastrophic event in the that happened in the building, we wouldn't have a capital to cover repairs. So we'll be back knocking on your door and needing money quickly. So this way we would have it if there's so if right now that, like event, which means if life is good and nothing horrible happens, hopefully we will not be asking for the December disposal. Okay. Uh, the, I don't the, know if that's where you were headed. I, I was headed there, but I, I was going to take a detour. Okay. Um, Right now, mm -hmm. there, there's a negative surplus in the budget. We yeah. have been tracking, no, but, but there's no fund balance surplus. No, we don't have a, a fund balance, we have a bank account, okay. and we have money in the bank account, uh, right? Uh, so, the, the, the past uh, you know, That's problem true. was we thought there was a fund balance, correct? Okay, so the full fund balance restricted, not that's all history. And it is, I guess, part of what uh, I'm concerned about long term. Mm -hmm. Is there a plan to develop a fund balance? Long term, yes. Yeah. And what's that long term like? <laughs> um, I, I know you got to dig out of the hole first. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah, we need to, as I mentioned in May, to us being financially healthy mm -hmm. has no more TAMs. I can't say no more village debt because we're obviously not paying off the original bond, but no more TAMs. Um, I would love to see us lowering um, the tax rate 
um, the library, and that we have three to five hundred thousand dollars in the bank for um, emergencies, and then grow from there. So, what's the projected and, tax rate, Ellen, that you're going to have to increase in order to get yourself straight? Well, the the budget I'm playing around with now is a six percent increase, which is what we did last year. Um, I'm just trying to get expense cuts closer to the tax rate, and we give it was, and I would love to be able to come in lower than that, but I don't know how we can. But we need to be prepared that if the budget is voted down, we have another hundred and eighty thousand dollar gap. Okay, it, it, what are what, what how do you pay back the 10? You don't raise it in tax until you don't pay back. Right. right. So in reducing our expenses, I mean I don't have it with me, but I'm happy to email Gary and board and Augie. I've done a two-year cash flow um, where it's cutting expenses. It's um, based, basing on the 6% tax increase. And based on that cash flow, we will need to roll or take out a new TAN in June of 24 or July of 24 of 450000 And that would be based again on my cash flow projections the last year of the town. So then how do you pay back that 10? The next one good. is again, continuing with expense cuts. All right, So, but you, you, you're talking now with the other 400,000, you're talking 1.8. That you, 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 it'll be an extra 1.8 that you owe us. No, no yes. because- it would, it would take it out for 1.4 plus 400. Right, but I said previously we probably don't need the money in December. December. So okay, so so I've got one one five zero and four fifty. Okay, so one point four again. Right, so we're back to one point five actually. I'll, yeah. I'll state it like it is, you know. But we're back to around the same original amount. It's just spreading it out. Okay, you may recall our biggest issue really is timing and the cash flow. We had asked for three different hands, and I appreciate the reduced costs in issuance of legal fees, but that would have spaced out the payback period. And, and the TANs have to be payback within a one year, year calendar. So right. it's... So uh, uh, is what happening here, we're going to have to pay back the TAN that we took? Yes. No, we're paying it. We have the money to pay. We will have the money to pay back the TAM. We're not asking. Well, I, I don't to... But I don't understand where the money's coming from. It's, yeah, you don't have a fund balance. You're only raising taxes 6%. Because we do have money in the bank. It's Our bank account is in zero. I mean, I, I repeat, I don't have the cash flow with me. That would explain where the money is. We have money in the bank. OK. It, when did we take out the TAM? In June. In June. So. Next June, we have to start paying back the ten. Right. Yeah. Right. And you'll be able to pay back with the additional four hundred and fifty thousand dollar tan. Well, that's but I mean that's what we discussed. Augie said we would be doing tans. His prediction <laughs> when we discussed this in May was probably a you know three to four years right. of doing this because part right. of the right. paying back the tan is. My Subsidy concern is we're not raising taxes enough to cover the ten. And my concern is if we raise the taxes, excuse me, raise the taxes too much, the budget will definitely get voted down, and we'll get no tax increase, and we'll have a bigger issue. Which, yeah, which is which is brings me back to the the cut the, the, the you're gonna have to slash the budget. We're working on it. I mean, we are definitely working. <clears throat> And so we've made more cuts throughout the year. We're going to continue. We're now closed on Sundays. So yeah. cuts meaning, is it going to be employee cuts? Or That's just... Cut. Yeah. So mean... far, we've reduced employees through attrition. Um, we are trying very hard not to cut employees as the public has come and asked us to try not to do that. You know, these are people's livelihood. But yeah. at the end of the day, 
you know, if we don't have a choice, we don't have a choice, but we're trying every other option first. I, I understand all this. I'm, I want to get these, these um, assurances directly from our staff. And, and I want, uh, and I want, uh, I want our staff on the inside of this working with you. I mean, that, that's, that's, I think that's, that's, it, 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 since, since the, our taxpayers are on the line here for this, I think, that, and we had asked that a while back, can, you know, and, and it was kind of turned And out. I had said to Jerry and Augie and Laura, they will, you're I'm happy to meet with them at any time and review anything. I still am happy to meet with you at any time. So the, that the, hasn't changed in months. The uh, concerns that Augie has brought up in, in his memo, can we get those addressed before the 26th? Those are all historical concerns. So then can we get an up, like your updated information then? Meaning everything. Like everything, everything you just discussed, like, can we have that? Yeah, we, 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 have we, that? we don't, yeah, we, yeah. Because I mean, that's well, historical. Once we get the representation letter, you'll have the final audit from O'Connor Davies. Mm -hmm. I will gladly put in the plug on the deficit to make the budget balanced. Um, I'll send you the cash. I'll send you the cash flow, and and um, we'll meet with Ellen, and I'll review their staff, and I'll see if there's any cuts that we could recommend to them about their staff. Yeah, I would. I, I, uh, before the twenty sixth, I, I would like to see this more as an oversight. Uh, um, I'd, I'd like to see a, a Jerry act as a, as a, 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 as an oversight to advise us on this because. Um, uh, it's just it's just a lot of money. It is a lot of yeah. money. Yeah, and 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 the taxpayers, uh, uh, you know, we we it's not, it's not our money. <laughs> it's not our money, but I think we also have to remember that if the library doesn't survive, then we have an eight million dollar fund that's our obligation for a building we don't own for a building that has mm -hmm. very little other use than a library, and for a library that we can't run without state intervention and a referendum. Well, that, uh, and, well that's why I think we need uh, our people on the inside to, 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 to make sure that the, 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 the cuts that need to be made are being made. And, uh, and, the, uh, and, and I think that's essential, essential. And, and, and I, I think that the, you know, don't, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, it doesn't carry anything, but but I think, you know, don't underestimate the voters. Uh, they know there's a problem and they want a library. And, uh, you know, it, it, right now, you know, the money's coming out of, it's, we, we have the same constituents, right? Mm -hmm. So the money's coming out of one pocket or coming out of the other pocket. So they, they know they're gonna have to pay it one way or another, you know, they're not, they're not naive, so. One of the things that I mentioned to Ellen the other day that um, I was thinking of doing before we finalize the budget to put up for the vote, uh, kind of doing focus groups at mm -hmm. the library mm -hmm. and having one scenario That's with 6%, one That's scenario great. with 10% here with the feedback yeah. is. Yeah. Be because because I, that will help inform us I think that's small. which way the wind is blowing. Well, I think there are many people I agree with Tom. There are many people who, you know, want the library to thrive and are willing to pay more in taxes for that to happen. There are also people who, as with the leaf blowers, don't really understand and feel that they pay taxes for the library and that they don't need to pay anymore. So I think just the way we have to do the pitch of the benefits of, get, of electric leaf blowers, I think we all need to get on the bandwagon about what the community needs to do to preserve the library. And it's great, some people can give a $50,000 contribution, not everybody can, exactly. but they can vote yes on the budget. And I'm sure this will be a big budget vote this year. You need to vote yes. Uh, yep. Crowns We're also having a, the centennial celebration in October is a big fundraiser. So we hope that's successful. And I, 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 just, I just got some information on that. To close this gap. Right. Um, I've been reaching out about 10 years ago to our um, foundation, charitable foundations in Ameronic and Large Um We'll see how that goes. I, I, I know, I know for you, Ellen, and I know for, for, for Ellen and all of you, it's a, this is a labor of love. 
you, 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 the, the, this is not becoming so loving anymore. I, I gotta tell you. And 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 uh and you you may need a colder eye on. You may need a, you may you, I I think I think you need Jerry's help. But that's my that's my feeling. Okay. LMC, I have people saying that they're having a hard time hearing. Oh, is it maybe you need to talk to the mic? So Ellen, did you want to have any? Uh, you have to get a not really other than the fact that we do have oh, yes, yes, yes. in the mic. Uh, in addition to Ellen working 24 7 on this, uh, we also have a gentleman called Richard Axe, who's from Larchmont. He is uh, has done. Uh, he is a business person who has worked with nonprofits. He's on the board of Mercy College. He's volunteering his time. I have to say there's no one smarter than Richard. And he has been going over our budgets with Alan, working together to reduce our budgets. He is working with Jennifer. He's worked with the auditors. He's terrific at getting everybody to work together. Um, so it seems as though it appears that we have been working hard to get outside help, but in fact, we have gotten some outside help who's really good and really smart. So I wanted to just add that because I don't think he's any of that. And he is acting as our treasurer um, currently. Thank you. All right. Uh, all right. So you meet with staff and we'll see you on the 20th. Sixth, I think it is right. Uh, but uh, I would like to instruct the staff to to, do, to have a uh, a presentation to us, it, it, evaluating the whole thing. Right. I'm sorry. It's actually the twenty fifth. It's Tuesday. No, no, it's 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 usually the 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 first and no, I'm sorry. It's usually the second and the fourth Mondays. Uh, but we pushed this to the 12th because of 9-11. But then we go back to the Monday. No, I think, no. no. It's still on the 26th. Never mind. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it, it's in my calendar as the 25th. I'll be here on the 25th to tell you it's tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure it's staying to me. All right. Um, I got it. Okay. It's already being set up. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, folks. I mean, we we want this to run smoothly. Yeah. Everybody. Everybody wants this to succeed. Come to our fundraiser. We'll be there. I'll, I'll be there. I'll tell you that. All right. Uh, there's items on for tonight's regular meeting. We we I, let's see. Let, let's let's go to executive session at seven twenty, uh, because there's there's another item that Mr. Spolzino uh, wanted to discuss that's timely and it has to do with the litigation uh, with Westchester General Waterworks and the United East States and what the United States government and the United States United States Justice Department. Uh, and I wanted to hear those words. When I was a kid. There was a, a, a crest in my house. It said Murphy, and underneath it said something in Latin. So one of my friends was over one time, and he says to my dad, Mr. Murphy, what's that? And my father, being my father, looked at it, acted like he could read Latin. And he said, the orphan indicted, never convicted. And they just kept walking. I think it's just uh, 3A, right? Uh, no, it's... Are we not done with all the new business? I just want to make sure we get this out of the way. Okay. Uh, 3A, establishment of traffic restrictions related to the Waverly Avenue bridge replacement. Has everybody had a look at these really? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and everybody yes. fine with it? Yes. 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 Should we explain so, so, what it is? Just... Yeah. It's a creating an all-way an all -way stop uh, at Fenimore Hoyt intersection, which is actually is already there. I, I saw that. Uh, I was going to say. It's, <laughs> it jumped the gun a little on that it's, one. It's a, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, but people are stopping. Uh, Sometimes. They, they added a stop sign over by the ice house. 
basically. Yeah, yeah. Right. So yeah. if you if you if you're coming <laughs> south on Fenimore, you have to stop by the ice. So we'll 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 make it legal. Yeah. In preparation for the bridge closure. Mm -hmm. uh, no standing restriction on Hoyt on Hoyt Avenue. Okay, have I found that? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. That's good. Uh, police detail on Waverly Avenue Bridge project to be reimbursed by the town of Mamaroneck. This is going to require a lot of police overtime uh, to direct traffic. And what were we saying, Jerry? Like near a half a million dollars? Correct. And the town will pay that? Yeah, because we're doing, um, the contractor has to pay it. The contractor has to pay it um, because it requires traffic control for the, um, for Fenimore, Hoyt, and Mamaroneck Avenue in Hoyt, um, which is going to be a mess during rush hour morning and afternoon rush hours. Do we have a signed agreement with the town or anything? We will. Uh, I don't know if we have a signed. Agreement. All right. It, it's just that we are, we already have the fee. It's the fee that we've established for. No, I know uh, what the fee is. I I want an assurance that the town is going to pay it. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what we ended up doing. What did you guys talk about in the meetings? Any kind of agreement? I, I, we can I, we can make one up. We can set. Yeah, I, I know that um, uh, the chief uh, had been uh, dealing with the town engineer about this. So we, we can, uh, I can ask her. I don't know if we'll, we'll, make, sure, we'll make sure the agreement comes to you on the 22nd. Or, or, or at least, uh, or at least an email. Mike on. Sorry. My mic's on. Or, or at least uh, an email memorializing it. Yeah. Okay. 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 Let's go back to uh, items that we haven't gotten yet. There's, now we have that out of the way. Let's see if we can grab one more item. E. E is, is, um, e is off the agenda. We, we're going to talk about that another time. There's, yeah. there's work that needs to be done. Uh, proposed local law to amend restrictions for subdivision plan. All right, that doesn't look easy. Uh, RFP response for administrative agency to implement affordable housing placement. Uh, so a little while ago, we put out an RFP for um, the work that um, the town of Mamaroneck used to do for us. Um, we um, we put out an RFP for an agency that would uh, handle the affordable housing placement. Uh, we sent out four specifically, three or four, I can't recall, to agencies that we were um, aware of through the county. And one returned, um, Westchester Opportunity, Westchester Housing Opportunities. Re residential. Residential, residential Opportunities, sorry. Um, it's the same entity that takes care of the affordable housing placement for the County of Westchester, as well as the city of Peekskill. So, and they're right in line basically with what they're charging Peekskill. From what I'm being told. How, how do they advertise? Well, like if we, if they're award, like how do they advertise what's in our community? So is that like look, its own, is that its own site or that be something that's embedded? Yeah, in it's it? a site. It's affordablehousing.org, I think it is. It's a site that's listed in the RFP. Got it, okay. So that's how they do it. They also have to do it um, with in various media ways. Yeah. Uh, and and then we would, would that be, would that site then be embedded in our site to see like? Correct. Like, so we would have a page. We would have a page and it would link to their site. To, Correct. No, okay. And, and we would list them as the agency that places. So basically mm -hmm. we're directing people Developers, sorry, to go to them as well as people looking for affordable housing, they would go to that. Right, okay. They'd maintain the list, they place off the list, they would do the required background Updates checks and, and all of that kind of stuff. Right. They would do everything, and the developer would be paying for it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one thing that we pay for, I think. Say that again. I think we do. We pay to maintain the list in the local community. Um, it look like that. That may be. That may be true. Hold on. So. I, I read something like that today, but I don't remember. I don't have. I don't have my. I, I'm trying to see. Uh, yeah. It's in like one of the tasks. There was no assigned fee, and it looked like it would be something that we would have to cover the cost of. On they keep the fees. They keep track of the number of you of the of the units that we have. Remember what page it is on? No, no because I can't access the one I wrote all my notes on. Okay. So, so task one to seven, mm -hmm. everything. So task one to seven, the developer does. It, or I, pays for. I would say 
Is it, it task, task three? Task three. I think it's task three. Yeah. It is. It's a thousand dollars a year. And I think that's probably our obligation. Mm -hmm. So our only okay. obligation would be that. It's the waiting list. Okay. Okay. To maintain the yeah the database. Yeah. And would we have access to the list, and then we'd be able to get access to, and just know what that if that list is growing, if that list is going up or down. Sure. Yeah. Like, is that just a request that they we would ask you list. to provide? Correct. And could we get that monthly? I can like monthly. Get, yeah, I just think we will be. I want to. I'm just very interested to know like how that list is moving because I just know from what they pounded like that waiting list set and said it was a witness for multiple years, and we have no idea if that list ever decrease or any after any people got homes. Like I don't know. Okay, I'm just interested in knowing if that is move. This is move or it's active. So since we only received one, um, and everything, um, when I reviewed it earlier, and then. Um, and, and then also today, again, everything looks like everything's uh, in place. Um, we can ask for some additional stuff from them. And the references, maybe? Like yeah. Peak scale. Is everybody doing this in Westchester two weeks? County. Yeah. I did get their name uh, from Westchester County. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, but yeah, I can do that with Peak Scale and Westchester County. And the county is using them now, I think, right? For, every, for everything, yeah. Okay. So Manny, I can ask them for that mm -hmm. as part of the award. This way they have to update us on the list monthly. Sweet. All right. Okay. Uh, this is good because uh, we have some way of doing this. Great. Thanks. So that put that on for two weeks. Yep. Great. Uh, a real quick one, and this will be the last one before we go into executive session, is the uh, designation of uh, butterfly, now yeah, butterfly milkweed as the official flower of the village. Anybody have any objections? I, I just have a question. How do we get to that particular um the mil butterfly milkweed? Oh, because it, it, it's the favorite uh food of the uh the monarch. monarch butterfly, and the monarch mayor prefers. That's no, I, I didn't. I, I would never. Oh, I, I was I was just asking because I I mean I know we uh, the the environmental committee does a lot with native plants and I was looking up that particular plant I was like it's not even really native to our community but the area so I just wondering what was the thought process. Well, I I have a thought on this and I, and I think it would be since it's not a a, a burning issue that we have to get, that well we, they wanted to have it done yeah, before the before the monarch butterfly. Well, I would like to I would like to have a a, a little bit of a of a. Uh, Contest. Does anybody else have any other uh, uh, candidates for this? And then we could uh, we could uh, evaluate so, that way. So can I put a plug in for the butterfly, the milkweed. Mm -hmm. It's toxic to spotted lanternfly. There you go. So. Oh, is that your? You need to do you're it. Just moved it to the top of the list. That's your name. Well, I didn't know. move. So yeah, <laughs> I got to just blue lose contest. I it's, a, it's an early favorite, but I but I think there might be other contenders. You know, I just uh, they, they, so, listen. They wanted to do this to, to promote the butterfly festival. I know. I'm on. I, I'm the liaison to, to the committee. <laughs> I, I brought that up. I, I think it would be be fun to have the community participate in uh, in choosing. Uh, and, and help helping with this choice. It can be a, a straw poll. It can be we can do it through the through the website. I think it would be a lot of. I understand it. It, 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 it ask us for to get it done before the festival, and this is the only meeting. I, I it, just to possibly satisfy Lou's comment, but maybe they could have the um, contest at the Monarch Butterfly um, Festival. Yeah. It could be either or. I don't know. Committee's not here, and if we don't vote on it tonight, well, then we'll, we'll, I mean we have one, but I. I that, that, He's the chair. I mean, I, you know, the, 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 so mm -hmm. what? Sandy needs that for the camera project. Okay. All right, we we got. Uh, right, 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 let's let's okay. I'm let's get a consensus for this. Um, and yeah, maybe we could find something else we could have a contest for in a more timely fashion because I like I like a good contest. All right. All right, and I'd like to vote on this too later on. Okay, I'd like to add it to the agenda. All right. Whatever. Nobody wants to play my game. I did. I did. <laughs> it's fine. I, I have breaking news. Uh, we have to get the uh, moving of poles and wireless upgrade in before we. Okay. Yes. Uh, Jerry, quick. So, so the proposal in front of you is the final piece of the puzzle to get all of our uh, cameras in sync and wired up, as many of you know, or at least the board knows, um, we've been fighting crime with these cameras. 
and it's been uh, a fantastic addition to the detectives unit. Uh, it's like having another detective on the street 24 hours a day. So um, there's just one, there's an upgrade that needs to be um, included in the system so that we can have uh, the cameras work in, in tandem in conjunction with each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which 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 poll camera? We talk about the ones we just acquired? No. 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 The other ones. Okay, okay. So where is this? Where is the poll? Where 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 is it not working right now? Where is that? The section is not working is old white plains road. That's old the white plains not, road. That with... section is not working. Where on old white plains road? All of them. But the connectivity. So right now we're we have to spend money because Connie don't, don't want to do their job. Exactly right. She's got it right on target, as usual. But, it, but there's also switches and stuff that have to be replaced. Yeah, but at the end of the day, if the police department has been sitting there contacting them and they just not answering and not doing their job, so, we have to spend money because... So this, this is the workaround. You're exactly right. And if not, if we're going to wait for Con Ed, we're going to stay. We're not going to have cameras that work. So this is the workaround. Plus, this also upgrades our equipment because the equipment that we had installed didn't have this type of capability in the past. And when were they first updated? Or were they installed? I'm sorry. Year. Last year. So last year, in a year's time, there needed to be an update. How often do they need to be updated? We're using this equipment that's available now to get around the kind of issue. And I, I, and I ask, how often do they need updates? I don't know. Because then... But we're using this, this equipment, which is updated equipment, to get around the kind of issue. Get it. Yeah. Okay, is everybody fine with movement of sport? Yeah. Yes. Me too. All right. Although I'm sorry, Annette is not more responsive. No, I, I hasn't been doing her job either. It comes down to our sidewalks and streets. Okay. Uh, where is that? You spill those. All right. Is that it for tonight? For the work? No, we, uh, I mean, for the. Um, for the I, need, I need a motion to uh, go into executive session. So moved. Second. Have, let, let me say what it's about. Connecticut Fund for the Environment, uh, doing business as Save the Sound uh, against us. Uh, this is 105.1D of the New York State Public Officers Law. Uh, Bob, what's the citation? Uh, Westchester General Waterworks versus? It's, um, well, there's technically no citation in the federal case because no case has been begun. Okay. But it's the United States EPA versus Westchester General Waterworks. Westchester General Waterworks and New York State Department of Health against Westchester General Waterworks. That's an actual case. Okay. Uh, it's basically our, uh, it's our our I and I case. I mean, no, it's not. No. Oh, okay. This is the the waterworks case. case. Okay, fine. Okay. In which, just to be clear, the, uh, the way the joint waterworks is established, mm -hmm. the village has legal liability. Right. Okay. Uh, I will make the motion on those. I make those two motions. Second. Call the roll. Trustee Rawlings? Yes. Trustee Yaisa uh, Reed? Yep. Yes. Trustee Sorry. Young? Yes. Trustee Lucas? Yes. Mayor Murphy? Aye. Thank you, Augie. Let me Gina in for the safe sound one. Let's go. I have to use the loop. Oh, on the of course. Oh, can we eat and stay out here? Yeah. Stay out here. Yeah. More room. Yeah. Yeah. All right, the mics. All right. More room. It's like having a picnic. <laughs> <laughs> Mom, I missed you. I haven't seen you in a long bit. It's just like a picnic. Instead of you know, you know, you know, yeah. yeah. One of those. I just. Uh, We're, and just give me, give me something. Now we see you. No, I, you know, I try to go a second. I'll sit here for a second. Yeah, but my Tom said for the roll. So you know, Tom's in there with Jerry. They're doing it purposely. Up to now, Tom always says, Sally, pull the roll, and I said, pull the roll. Well, because you're back in. Hey, you can't.
I'm going to make a motion to close the work session. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, good evening, and welcome to the September 12th, uh, 2023 Board of Trustees regular meeting. Please join me in a pledge of allegiance. Aye. Pledge of allegiance to the flag Aye. of the United States of America, Aye. to the republic for which it stands. Thank you. Uh, there are exits on my right, exit on my left in case of an emergency. Uh, if you have a cell phone, please put it on mute. You're open to me. I am going to ask what I usually do. Uh, I'd like a motion to open the meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, first up is two presentations tonight. First is a presentation by the original civics research children, uh, young men, looks like tonight. Uh, would you like to come up to the mic? This is a uh, extracurricular of the high school. Please state your name, gentlemen. Jason Fenders. Hi, uh, I'm Ezra Wang. Uh, Aaron Mills. So the reason we are here is to clarify the funding request for our participatory budgeting initiative. We presented before the board um, either late June or early July. Our participatory budgeting initiative is aimed at increasing youth civic engagement in the Mamaroneck Union Free School District. This happens because the local government, we are asking that the local government, the village of Mamarina, set aside a small pot of money, which the students then get to use to propose ideas, develop those ideas, and ultimately vote on those ideas. So the students get to propose projects that they will then ultimately get to see be implemented within the community. 
Now, I believe there might have been a quite um, a small communication or misunderstanding the last time that we presented. The original request was for up to $5,000 for the initiative. I understand how the number 1,000 might have been stuck in all of your heads because the pilot that we launched, launched at Chatsworth last year, we received 1,000 from the village of Larchmont to run that pilot, which was very successful. Now we are asking for up to $5,000, but we are very appreciative of whatever you all are willing to give us. Um, and I guess also just for an additional clarification, um, we are doing this in all of the three municipalities and across all five of the um, elementary school, or sorry, four of the elementary schools. Um, we've received funding from the other municipalities and are waiting for funding um, from you all. Um, and we've also received commitments from the elementary schools to run this pilot in the fourth grade this upcoming year. Um, after over the summer, we worked on expanding the curriculum so that it met some of the New York State standards and regulations so that this can sort of fit into the fourth grade curriculum that's already existing and, you know, work to cover some of those units that they would have to do otherwise. Okay, good. What have the other uh, two municipalities, municipalities committed yes. budgetarily? The town of Mamaroneck has committed $3,000 and the village of Larchmont, another $1,000. And then is this like, is this money that we're putting aside, is this something that we're putting aside in our budget? And when you do the research and there's a designated project, you're gonna to come to us and essentially ask us to try to implement that, implement the project with the money we put aside. Yeah. If we're not, there's no exchange of funds between you and I, we're just we're just allocating a pile of money. Yep, that's exactly correct. The village is the one who ultimately implements the winning projects. And, and um, uh, give us an idea of what type of uh, um, public uh, amenity that, that that might result from this. Uh, so last year we had several projects uh, with Chatsworth. The project that ultimately wound up winning was a new water fountain at Flint Park. Um, some other ideas were new bleachers, new tents for baseball fields, a uh, uh, big chess set new tables at some of the local parks. So it's uh, mostly things in the local parks, things that everyone in the community will be able to enjoy, not just the students. Yeah. And again, this is something that um, these ideas were proposed and things that the students wanted, but ultimately are able to be used by everyone in the community and by whoever may want to access. So, so we, will you give us an array of options? So... So basically, I mean, we can walk you through again what the process looks like. We didn't want to take a no, 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 no. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm not being clear. But it, what I meant was, will, will you say these are three or four possible projects that the students were thinking of? So the students are the ones who are the ones that vote on the narrow down list of projects. So we will go to the fourth graders. Each student will propose a couple, one or a couple of ideas, and we end up with a list of around eighty to one hundred. A steering committee comprised of us and other community members then narrows that list down to about 10 projects, which the students then vote on those 10 projects. So they choose a winning project. If the village is not comfortable with that winning project, we completely understand that. And if you don't want to implement that, we'd be happy to go to an alternative well, project. I, I guess what, what I'm getting at is maybe uh, if you can give us a choice of three projects, your top three votes. That's are you are you asking is that how it goes or would we be we willing would, to do that? Would you be willing to do that? Yeah, we would be willing yeah, to do absolutely. that. Absolutely. So something that we ran into even last year when we worked with the village of Larchmont was when we had it down to the winning project, which was the water fountains. We were in communication with them, asking them, look, is this something one you're comfortable doing, you're able to do? Um, and it ended up yes, but if it hadn't been, then we could switch to one of the other top four things. And this would be a, and each project would be something that will be in the village of Mamarina, correct? Yes, it is yeah. not within the school district. It's, it's within the community, yeah. yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, I like this because it, uh, it engages uh, our younger citizens and, um, you know, gets them involved and they're, they're, they're coming to us with a, an idea. What does the board want to do? I'd like to... Um, I think we could uh, we could uh, we wouldn't have to settle on a, on an amount. We would have to see what the idea is and uh, and. Um, but don't you think I think have a wrong way. I think we yeah. need to have all yeah. oh, max. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. no more. It's, it's it's about budgeting. Yeah, oh, yeah. Because we don't have to put the stuff on the side now. Yeah, that's part of the process. When we talked to when we were getting started with this idea, we talked to a lot of other people who <laughs> implemented participatory budgeting in their communities. And they said a key step was getting the funds allocated first to ensure that we would have them. 
especially oh. just because I feel like it's it's very hard to ask students to you know have an idea and have a project mm -hmm. when they don't know the limitations of what they're they're feeling for. Of course. Uh, so I had a couple questions, and and it, I'm relieved to find out that the money is the village's money. Mm -hmm. We're not giving because I, I don't think we can give money to another no, organization. No. I think that that was, and that you know, in, in the other communities that have done it, there's a portion of their budget, and then they they so basically there's a, a it, like city of Boston does it, many other places do it, and they actually work with the students or the young people because can be up to different age, you know, like up to the stage 25, and they actively work with people and have a chunk of their budget that's allocated by not necessarily the taxpayers, but by kids. Um, I, my, I have two concerns. One is that we have two different school districts in our community. So we have Rynek, and so we're allocating money for one school district mm -hmm. that doesn't actually have necessarily, the doesn't serve village. the entire community and also most, you know, more, most of the students in the town of Marinette School District don't live in the village of Marinette. They live in other communities. But as long as I'm more comfortable if the project comes back here. Um, and I think it's sort of, it's, it's in a way you are all acting, if we're, you're acting as the agent for our community or budget participation process and Instead of us having to do it, or our staff having to do it, you're kind of acting as that job. Um, I would encourage you, as a, I've been a Girl Scout mentor for a long time, to make sure you invite some of the students to come to a meeting. We'll be on our, you know, I think that would be beneficial. But I, I, the two concerns I had were one, we can't be giving money away, but this is money that we'll retain for a project the village will do. The village will ultimately have control over the project. Um, it's and C is that is this something that we can do. Can we see, I guess, we, it, is, is it any different than giving, let's say the arts council or another committee a line, you know, like a chunk of money in the budget and say, you do the programming with it? I mean- well, it depends on what the, uh, it depends on what the project is. Well, so I'm just, whether the structure is something that's legal, I want like to check with Bob. It's called like, so So, I would be curious to see how the other municipalities have done this. Mm -hmm. I mean, my understanding is that the village can't give money away. The village has to enter into a contract with someone, at least the school district and someone to provide a deliverable, whatever that may be. Um, and so that's what, that's what I think we'd have to do here, but maybe the other attorney to figure out a way to do it without doing that. So I, I'm curious to see what the well, 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 it seems as though we, from from what the student said, we execute the project. They yeah, just they, they help. They just tell us the project is yeah, building a sunset. Handing over money, it, it, it's our well, project. We're handing them money to do. Yeah. So, so for a clarification on that, um, you're not really giving us any money. We mm -hmm. don't really have the ultimate control over the money. All we're sort of doing is asking for a commitment that of up to some amount of money that when a project does get decided by the students, you all would be willing to execute that project through village departments and village funding. Okay, so there's district. no payment to the school district to you? No. 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 Just yeah. it's been, I mean, you're ultimately going to make a decision. Yeah. Yes. Essentially, it's holding us accountable. Yes. Yeah. Right. If, they say, if we say we're going to give fund 3000 they do, you know, work with the student, with the elementary students and come to a project that costs $3,000. It may just needs to come to us. So we need to hold our end of the bargain and say, we're going to do this because we're making some type of informal agreement. No, no, no. Go ahead. So my suggestion, because Nora brought it up, because we have two school districts, is are you planning on talking to like maybe the fourth graders or whoever at um, Bellows? We weren't so, planning on doing it this year. We are certainly interested in possibly doing it in future years. So last year was the first year that we did this initiative. We just started at Chatsworth Elementary School. This year, we're expanding it to all of the elementary schools in the Mamaroneck Union Free School District. In the future, we are certainly interested in branching out to even more elementary schools and making this initiative more widespread. But for this year, for convenience purposes, considering it's just our second year, we wanted to keep it within the Mamaroneck Union Free School District for convenience. Yeah. And I, th I think also to answer that concern, um, the final project would be a project that I think anyone that well definitely anyone in the village of Mamaroneck could use. So it's not 
just limited to those who go. No, I understand that. I just, you know, just to be inclusive and <clears throat> include the voices of the young ones from that school district, you know, it would be, it would be something that they could also be proud of as well. But I understand that every person in the village or every child could benefit from it. But it was just, just in terms of inclusivity. I, th I think it's a nice start. I, I liked it when I first heard mm -hmm. it. I still like it. And, uh, the, the question is how much money well, would we want to set aside? Three thousand. I have one more question. When would when would we know the final designation of the project? Yeah. So it would most certainly be before the end of the school year. So the latest would be June twenty twenty four. We're still coordinating with principals, making sure that it figuring out the timeline because, as Ezra mentioned, we expanded on the curriculum step. So we'll now be providing all the teachers in the elementary schools with lesson plans to help them hit. New York State social studies standards and practices. So we need to make sure that that all works out with how the teachers plan to teach their class, but we'll most certainly know by June 2024. So yeah, so essentially we'll be funding a project in our next fiscal budget, year. Right, in our next that's budget. true. That's it why it has to go into our next budget. Yeah, it wouldn't be in this one. Okay, we could we could simply uh, express a, 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 a <laughs> uh, intention to do that, I would think, right? Uh, I think we have to put on a work session. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll put it on our work session in two weeks to okay. confirm such a to confirm an amount to confirm an amount and uh, you know just to have a resolution and uh, then we'll we'll vote on it probably that night or the night after. Excellent. Thank you. And are we are we allowed to attend that work session? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Perfect. And they're, perfect. They're televised as well, R right here at five fifteen. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. No, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thanks, guys. Have a good evening. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, next presentation, HVEA, Briefing on Holstead Avenue Safety Improvements. Uh, some you folks might have noticed uh, that uh, the village has done uh, a, a cosmetic paving of Holstead Avenue. Uh, we are going to soon uh, do a, a, a massive uh, redo of Holstead Avenue to make it much more pedestrian friendly and to make it much more drivable. So I'm sorry, who, who, here to produce the uh, presentation tonight is? Yes. Um, so my name is Mia Nadesi. I'm from HBA Engineers. And we're here tonight to talk about pin uh, 8762 and that's the Holstead Avenue Sidewalk Improvements Project. Um, the funding was a grant through the Transportation Alternative Program, oh, and that supports- yeah. yeah. I'm just the cover side, so I can um, slowly go on and say that. Make sure it's up by students. Mm -hmm. um, so the transportation alternative uh, program, and that's definitely a funding program that supports uh, transportation alternatives besides cars. So the sidewalks are a perfect example of that. And the fact that it connects to the train station, the multimodal aspect, we think um, really helped enhance the uh, application. So they, the funding has been already granted to the village. And um, yeah, they got an extra incentive for being attached to the train station. So that supports it. It's federal funding. There's a match, uh, a local match to that, but it's a grant program. Um, so it's over and above the extra, the federal funding that the town, the village gets. So um, I have here tonight Martin Evans and uh, Steve McAvery. Martin will be the program project manager, and Steve will be the project engineer. Um, Steve is the former uh, regional New York State DOT uh, ABA pedestrian uh, regional coordinator, and Martin is the former New York State DOT uh, director of the regional local projects uh, federal aid program. So uh, it's definitely our main, our A team, the team that comes from the state. You know, so they have more experience than uh, than all was put together on these second projects. So um, Steve will be presenting in a minute, but uh, before uh, we go on, there's just a few things. This is a public information meeting. It's not a public hearing, but all of your comments will be memorialized in the design report. So we'll take all those, and so for that reason. We like to have them be written comments. So, um, 
some different instances. If you ask a question tonight, Steve will do his presentation. We'll have the questions at the end. But if you ask a question tonight, we ask you please also fill out a form, a comment form, which we have here, so that we have it in writing, so we make sure it gets in the report, and then put it in the box on your way out. Um, if you're not comfortable asking in person tonight, then just fill out a form in writing, and we will answer all those forms. Um, and they will all be memorialized in the design report. Um, if you're watching on streaming or tomorrow morning, or um, you hear about the project in some other way and you'd like to make a comment, um, you can talk to the uh, deputy village manager and uh, send him your comment and give your, you can give your information if you want to get a response back directly, or you can just give him the comment and we'll memorialize it this time. Um, and then lastly, if you live along the Halstead Ave corridor and you have property adjust adjacent, you have a specific question about what's happening in front of your driveway front door, um, this would probably not be the best place to um, ask. What we'd like you to do in that situation is talk to the uh, deputy building manager. And in those instances, we'll also we'll come to you and we'll bring a set of plans and we'll actually talk with you about what we plan to do in front of your, in front of your house. Um, so, and that will also be all memorialized in the design report. Uh, so the last piece is the design report that I keep referring to. Um, I checked with Dan and that will be posted on the village uh, website or will be posted or available at the village by request so that you know that your, your comment was uh, included and was addressed. Um, so now C is gonna go through the details of the project and then we'll have, we'll be open for questions at the end. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, so I'm just I'm gonna go through the project a little bit, just the objectives, what we're trying to do, and a little bit of detail. Um, so the objectives with the TAP grant are to reconstruct, remediate the existing sidewalks, install um, and remediate the existing curb ramps, and fill in the sidewalk gaps where there's missing sidewalks. So we have a complete uh, pedestrian transportation network along Halstead Avenue. Um, along with that, we want to um, take some measure to improve pedestrian safety, uh, such as curb extensions um, at certain intersections, and some other traffic calming um, ideas that we will go to in a minute. I'm gonna upgrade the traffic signals to meet ADA standards and pretty much overall just provide a safe and accessible pedestrian transportation system. Okay, next one. So the existing conditions are consistently inconvenient. Um, typical of an older village or city, there's sections of sidewalk that are ADA compliant for 10 feet, and then another section of 10 feet that's not ADA compliant. Um, so what that leads us to is that we're pretty much replacing the sidewalks from the Maranek Avenue to Hunter Street, almost all of them, except for two spots. Section in front of the train station that goes downhill towards Jefferson Street. Mm -hmm. And then the section in front of, I think it's in the Marinec Towers mm -hmm. is, is ADA compliant. The, okay, yeah, so we can go to the next one. Next one. Well, do you have a sec? Yes. All right, I'm in between glasses, so. <laughs> um, okay, so like I mentioned, two of the measures that we're looking at and proposing to use are for pedestrian safety and traffic calming are curb extensions, which is a picture on the left, which commonly referred to as curb bump outs, sidewalk bump outs, which brings the pedestrian further out into the crosswalk area so that the drivers can see somebody who wants to cross the street. The pedestrians can see much better whether traffic is coming. The other measure is some textured and colored pavement on the interior of intersections, which is it basically 
slows drivers down. They like tend to see that and, and see a difference in the pavement. It's not just the uh, black asphalt and the yellow lines. Um, so we're looking at that at some key intersections. Uh, and, oh, and there's an example. The closest example that I know of is Court, Court Street in White Plains. If you're interested to see what that looks like. You go to the next one. Uh, the two traffic signals that will be replaced is uh, the one on Ward Avenue and Halstead Avenue intersection and the Barry Avenue Halstead Avenue intersection. They're, they're substandard. They're not um, ADA compliant. Uh, so we're, we're looking to replace those in full. Um, next one. So the key intersections that we identified based on discussions with the village, based on observations and watching people come and go where, and also looking at um, Google Earth, where are the pedestrian generators, schools, things like that, and where are the pedestrian destinations, you know, neighborhoods, things like that. So um, we've come up with North Ferry Avenue as a key one, Ward Avenue, Florence Street, Jefferson Street, and Carroll Avenue, kind of pretty much in that priority order. Um, so we're, that's where we're looking at the um, traffic coming, the textured and colored imprint, and, and definitely the curve extensions there. You can go to the next one. So I've got a few plans, not of the whole thing, that would have been a lot, but um, <laughs> go to the Barry Avenue. And this just shows in blue, the new sidewalks, um, the crosswalks, the in between the crosswalks, we propose to use the colored and textured pavement. Um, and the curb extensions or curb bump outs on the corners. Um, also, leading down to the east, the curb is pushed out a bit and also a little bit on the west side as well. Um, that helps kind of neck the road down a little bit to help slow up drivers as they're moving through. Um, and there's also a bus stop on the, it would be the northeast end and the southwest end near the Carvel. Um, that allows the bus to pull in and then pull back out and gives us more room. The extensions actually help give you more room to get the ADA compliance done because um, things get a little tight in the village. So I have a question about North Barry. So the, um, we're replacing the traffic lights in this project. We're replacing, we're planning to replace the traffic lights. Right. Will they be all red so that Everyone stops. I don't know what it's called. They it don't always stop. It's an always stop. stop. That's what we're. we're pedestrian phase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pedestrian phase. Right. right. Martin, do you know? Yes, <laughs> a pedestrian phase is being proposed right now, but in the design report, it's the we have uh, yeah. okay. okay. In the design report, we present those options and the impacts to traffic. When you're stopping all approaches, uh -huh. there there is more delay. So. Yeah, we definitely are considering that, and uh, we'll present that uh, option in the detail. Yeah. Yeah. Is it just you know a bit of information about that traffic light specifically? It, it's so old that it cannot accommodate pedestrian crossing signals. The controller. The controller. So we don't. Even, that's why there are even no crosswalks at that intersection. And so it's 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 a needed improvement <laughs> to replace that signal. Thanks, sir. Thank So I think we can go to the next one. So we're jumping around a little bit only because we're, we put these slides in the priority order of the key intersections as opposed to as you travel down the road. So we're jumping back to uh, the Ward Avenue um, intersection. So on the, the south side, we have the curb extension. Mm -hmm. We have the pavement treatment in the intersection. Um, sidewalks being replaced on the north side, on the train station side. On the left side of the plan there, that shows the sidewalk where the, there's a missing piece of sidewalk um, where cars park and there's a stone retaining wall. Mm -hmm. So that part we're including in the project. 
Um, and I'll get to how we want to set the project with, with base bids and alternate bids um, when I get through the plan here. But, and then the, from that sidewalk to your right in front of the train station is what we're proposing to improve that section in front of the train station, to clean it up with the parking. There's, there's angled parking, there's 90 degree pulling parking, there's parallel parking. Um, but we it, we're asking for a lot with the amount of money we have for this. So and I'll, I'll get to that. Um, let's see. Let's say so. um, and oh, I'm sorry, the traffic signal replacement at this intersection. So we can go to the next one. Okay, so um, at Florence Street area, um, kind of repetitive now. We have the curved extensions at the corners at the intersection. We want to do the color textured um, pavement in the middle of the intersection. Um, and this is where it gets a little tricky with the um, some of the on-street parking. And I'm going to go over that in another two slides. So you can see as you get away from the intersection, the, um, the blue kind of sticks back out towards the road. And that's where they were bringing the sidewalk in, into the shoulder area. So we lose a few on street parking spots. Um, and I'll go over that um, in a couple slides here. Uh, let's see, I think we can go to the next one. So on Jefferson Street, uh, this we didn't identify this as a as a huge pedestrian. Um, traffic area. I mean, it's got a lot of pedestrians, but compared to some of the other sections, intersections, it, it mm -hmm. ranked down a little bit. But it's such a wide open intersection. It just kind of like screamed out at us to like, you know, bring this in, bring the sidewalks, you know, in and, and make this intersection smaller to get people to slow down as they're coming through there. So that shows the sidewalks, you know, kind of extending out on all, all basically three corners there. Um, and certain type, times of the day when the commuters are either coming or going, you get a lot more traffic. It gets busy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that will help with that. So, so the one thing on the car wash side yeah. is that if you give them more sidewalk, they're going to take it and park cars there to yeah. dry them off. Mm -hmm. So there's going to have to be some kind of treatment when you expand that that sidewalk. Okay. That's so that enough. so that that's not added space for them to park an additional car to. Okay. Yeah. No, good to know. Yeah, and I think to to uh, Trustee Young's comment, sure. uh, yeah. the crosswalk that is uh, kind of slanted from uh, going across Fawcett Avenue, I think that's a new. That would be a new crosswalk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's something that's not there currently. Mm -hmm. And we we included that you know so because we are cognizant of the amount of uh, pedestrian traffic coming. Much needed. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a fairly new stop sign there too. Yeah, that was within the last like two years. Yeah. Two years, yeah. Okay. Um, go the next one, which is it's Carroll Avenue, Wagner Avenue. Um, so curb extensions at Carroll on the east side. Um, that seemed to be where most action was happening. Um, and then down at uh, Wagner, sidewalk comes out into the shoulder area now. Um, and that's no parking mark. There's no parking now. So we felt it was actually easier to move it out into the shoulder as opposed to moving it, make our improvements and have to go into the front yards um, through this section. And okay, next one. Now we're at um, Halstead Avenue, pretty much across from Edward Place. And on the, and the next slide, you'll see on the left hand side at the top, the blue area, the sidewalk pushes out into the shoulder again. And this is where we run into the issue of. We have room on that side as far as highway boundary, but we'd be totally reconstructing the front yards and the landscaping of some of these residents. And then we wanted to avoid that and 
we so we were able to move the curb out and, and have the sidewalk out here. And I think the next slide shows it pretty good. There's two photographs that mm -hmm. show it. Yep. So you got the retaining walls. They're not ADA compliant now. Mm -hmm. Um so the only way to make them ADA compliant is hold the curb line and push it into the landscaping and the walls and everything, or move it back out the other way. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if we move it back the other way, that means that's where you're saying eliminating parking? Yes. And so if we do eliminate parking on that side, um, is it room for a bike lane? Bike lane? No, I don't think so. All right. No, I think any bike accommodations would have to be done with uh, what is called the Sharo, Jaro painting mm -hmm. on the, the road. Painting um, the like arrows. Yeah, a little bike with the arrows on it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There's really not room with the on-street parking there because we're we the where we're losing parking is spotty. We're not losing consistent parking okay. throughout. It's where the curb extensions come out. We might lose a couple here or there. This spot is a good example of where that happens. I think we lose three. At, at this spot, two or three, three. Okay. Um, so total on street parking loss is about 18 on street parking um, locations. Don't include the train station right? without the train station. Um, oh, without the train station. Yeah, that goes down to like eight. Yes, 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 because I did include the train station. But yes, right. so it does go down. And again, it's spot. It's like, one at a we might lose one at a quarter corner because the curb extension we lose you know three at this location um so there's still plenty of on street parking throughout the whole corridor um let's check and see if i forgot anything no okay no we can go to the next one so just to explain the right-of-way needs for the project um there's a good amount of right away. Unfortunately, we ran into a couple of spots where we don't have enough right away. So for example, picture on the left, there are, I think, four locations like that where the um, highway boundary comes to a square, but there's these entrances to a business or restaurant that to reconstruct the sidewalk and the curb ramps and make them ADA, ADA compliant is very challenging without stepping over that red line yeah. and reconstructing the entrance into the restaurant, which we cannot do because Village doesn't own that property. But we can do it under a property release, which is um, the owner signs a release form, allows the project and the contractors to go on to that little piece of property, make it work, and also allow for you know an entrance into the business. The other issue we ran into was on the uh, right hand side picture there. Um, there was a stretch where, and this is common in older villages and towns, the highway boundary is about one foot off of the building face. So we can rebuild the sidewalk right up to that spot, leave the old sidewalk there. Um, it's possible, it's not the best way to do it. Um, the other way to do it is to just rebuild the whole sidewalk from building face out. But again, we need a property lease for that one foot or one and a half foot mm -hmm. sliver of land that a property owner doesn't even quite realize that it's theirs. Um, mm -hmm. And we've talked to DOT about it and that's they agreed that that's an acceptable approach. That, uh, that eliminates us having to acquire and purchase the land for temporary easements and for permanent easements. Um, there's a few other right away or property, I should say property releases where when the sidewalk is rebuilt, they're you're gonna need another couple of feet to tie into like a driveway or somebody's front walk. So the contractor's gonna need two, three feet, maybe five feet at the most, but just to make that transition much smoother. And those would also be done with property releases. Um, okay, next. So the cost, the programmed amount for the project is uh, 3.48 million. Um, it's an 80% federal 
money, 20% local, local match. Um, and this project sets itself up very well for what's referred to as alternate bidding. So we would set the project up with, with what is called the base bid. And we target that and make our estimates so it, it hits that programmed amount thereabouts. And then we put in different alternates in the project. Uh, I don't know how many yet, might be one, might be, it's probably gonna be about three is my guess. Um, so that when the bids come in, maybe you get lucky and the bids come in and the base bid plus alternate one hits that programmed amount. But it also gives the village the flexibility to see what the bids are and either go after other money or allocate other money to include alternate one, alternate two, alternate three, or you know, or whatever you choose to do. So that's how we propose to set up the, the contract when it goes out to bid. So we won't we won't have to. If there is extra money, we won't have to pick alternate one before alternate two. We could pick two and three. Are you we going to set it up. We set it up. We'll okay. be set up in a sequence that is clear to the bidders of how how it will be worked. And okay, yes, you have to yes. set it up in the bid. Right. Which one you'll take first? So yes. you do the base bid, which is all the sidewalks from here to here, mm -hmm. and then plus this. Would you like me to use the microphone? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't want to give it up. Go ahead. <laughs> so you have the base bid, which is the entire corridor sidewalks, and then you have intersections while A, B, C, D in the priority that we've established pretty much with the village. And then you'll have here, and then you can look at the funding, and that would be a village board decision about where you want to draw the line, which which alternates you want to include. It, it would basically be the menu option. It would be, it would be the menu option. You know, you'll yeah. have that you know what we there. can say, we'll, we'll do you know, this and this, or this and that, or that and this. OK, good. Thanks. Um, so right now we're just kind of looking at the alternates as the, um, the colored and textured intersection pavement, um, maybe when we sharpen our pencils into our estimate deck, but they, they can get into the base bid, mm -hmm. or maybe one of them gets in the base bid or something like that. And then the Jefferson street intersection, um, and then Carroll Avenue, and then the area in front of the, uh, Metro North train station, not including the missing sidewalk section. Um, because that does, it's a lot of work. It does take a good bite out of the yes, money that's allocated. Um, okay, I'm going to go to the next one. And this is the last bill, which is the our schedule as we see it right now. Um, so after this meeting, we get comments. We want to wrap up the design report that Mia was referring to, send it into DOT for their review. To make sure we're in the federal state standards and guidelines, um, received design approval, which is they approved the design report and we can now move into detailed design phase. That would be sometime in November and then receive that authorization to go into detailed design shortly thereafter, um, finish up the project and the contract uh, documents, which is the plan specs and estimate, send that into DOT for review in um, September of next year, um, get authorization to proceed with construction, um, advertise in December of next year, and award it in about March of 2025. Um, and then construction, we're thinking that season uh, from March to November about. Um, and just a reminder, if you have comments, Write them down, email Dan, and it helps a lot to see them in writing. Not that we don't want to hear them, it's just I'm the one going to be answering them. So <laughs> it helps me a lot to just to have the in writing. I can like kind of think it through a little better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And just want to. This was something we started a few years ago. We did the first walking uh, walking safety assessment on Holstead Avenue. It was run by uh, Shannon uh, Purdy. And uh, this I think is really the offshoot of that. And I wanna thank you all for doing that. I wanna thank the citizens who participated, participated in that safety assessment walk. Uh, it, was, it was very enlightening. Okay, uh, the next on the agenda is we're gonna 
take Jerry's uh, village manager report uh, because he has he has a, a report on flooding, which I think a lot of people in the room are interested in. And usually everybody's gone when he gives this report. So Jerry. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I'm happy to report that on uh, September 5th, our dredging contractor came in and started immediately working on the Sheldrake River. Um, the reason um, he's in now in our village is because we've been able to secure five separate permits or letters of uh, authorization. We received the Westchester County letter uh, for a stream control permit, a New York State Thruway Authority work permit, the Army Corps of Engineers authorization, which is recent, is basically based on the recent uh, New York State DOS uh, approval that we uh, received. In um, August, I was able to report that we received the DEC permit. And uh, like I mentioned, uh, the last permit, uh, we were able to secure the approval from the New York State DOS. Uh, so we've been dredging uh, for about a week or so. Uh, they're moving along very quickly. We are removing the spoils and um, uh, disposing of them. The dredging contractor that we have is the same contractor that secured the outfall jetty uh, project for um, Westchester County. This is in Harbor Island, Island, the outfall jetty. Yeah, at Harbor Island Park. If you're looking at the beach, it's toward the right. Towards the right, off the, uh, at the end of that walkway. Um, so there's some efficiencies in our project that we can uh, capitalize on with their project. Um, they'll be um, working in the Sheldrake probably for several weeks. Uh, there's a big portion of this project that was approved for the bend at uh, Bub Walker Park. So they'll be working on that uh, in the coming weeks with uh, putting in materials. And we'll keep working um, as we can uh, based on the weather, to continue to, uh, to dredge. Our, our guys did quite a bit of work as I reported last time. Um, our crew, our DPW crew, they did a lot of work. We continue to remove dead trees. So. Occasionally, uh, we have our tree contractor bring in cranes to remove dead trees that are um, in the riverine area that we haven't been able to uh, remove. So we're removing them with the crane. Um, so that's the dredging um, update. I do not have, although I will try to secure one for September 26th, an update from the Army Corps. Uh, I know that our project manager was uh, on maternity leave. I think she's coming back soon. So we will try to get that update uh, for you in two weeks. An update on the, um, the state of emergency rodent control. We've been at it for over 30 days. Um, we've significantly reduced, significantly reduced the population on Waverly Center, Madison, Washington Center. And we moved in recently to Ralph, Gertrude, Elliott, and Monsignor Goodwine. During that process, where we um, were able to use CO2 to eradicate the rodents in their um, little burrows. We uh, issued 40 um, orders to remedy for residents in that neighborhood. We, re we re removed eight abandoned vehicles that had been flooded during Ida. Uh, we took down two dilapidated sheds that were basically harbors for them, um, three log piles, which apparently they love, and piles and piles of debris. Um, a lot of people have been cooperating in that community, um, pruning any overgrown or, or removal of overgrown uh, shrubs and things of that nature. Our next area is Lester Van Rance, and uh, generally the, I guess it's the south side of Mamaroneck Avenue, um, along the Mamaroneck River. And as we clear areas, we go in with something called nature's defense, which is cinnamon oil, peppermint oil, garlic, cloves, rosemary, and thyme, a mixture of that. Um, and it acts as a natural deterrent for them to go back. Um, and so there's been a lot of positive uh, from the community. And the real positive is the fact that we're cleaning up properties that have been uh, neglected or, you know, in, uh, derelict. In, poor, yeah, derelict, in poor condition for a long time. So that's the update on the rodent control, but that's ongoing. 
And you've also been asking people to make sure that their garbage is in oh, yeah. in, in in bins on the Marinic mm -hmm. Avenue. Lids, and we've also that. communicated that with our sanitation workers because they go to the backyards and side yards. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> we don't care what type of garbage can you have as long as you have a lid on it. That's all we care about. Um, it doesn't you know it can be green, it could be blue, it can be yellow. Nobody cares. But really, as long as it has a lid on it, that's very important. And the fact that there are garbage cans or there are bags in garbage cans mm -hmm. instead of off to the side. Because that's just that's just adding trouble. Um, it's a buffet. Yeah. One item that uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Young asked me to read at the uh, meeting as part of my report <clears throat> is an email that we received uh, regarding our building inspector. And it's entitled "Great Human Expressing Gratitude," and it says, "Dear Mr. Barbario, I hope this email finds you well. I'm writing to express my utmost appreciation." the outstanding dedication exhibited by one of your remarkable employees, Carolina Fonseca. I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge Carolina's exceptional commitment to her work, particularly in relations to the way she helped my family and I through our home renovations. She showed a great deal of empathy. We closed on our home in May and began renovations that were required. This is our first New York home purchase and we definitely lacked planning and preparation on our end. We heard the nightmares of how challenging it would be to work or contact the village of Mamaronet. It was just the opposite. Carolina Fonseca showed unwavering dedication, staying true to her word, and cons consistently delivering results beyond what we expected. Her responsiveness and willingness to go above and beyond our initial expectations were truly impressive. During a time where we don't have anywhere to stay or running low on funds, she picked up, listened, and addressed our concerns to the best of her ability. Her help was impacted, has impacted us a great deal, and we could we cannot thank her enough. She deserves recognition and praise. I kindly request that you pass this along, along my sincere gratitude to Caroline Fonseca for her unwavering dedication to the families of Mamaronek. Uh, warm regards, Mr. Santana, uh, Mamaronek, New York. So, That's great to hear. So it is. I know she's she's jumped in with uh, gusto and has worked a lot of long hours. She has, and she was here tonight until she had to leave to go pick up her kids. So, um, that's just a question. Do we have an update on the cameras? Our cameras? Yeah. The, the um, yep. yeah. Yeah. So, so our yeah. flood cameras, all our flood cameras are working. We had a meeting with IT um, to make sure that we have the uh, way I want to broadcast everything. So they're all up and working. And uh, James, Pablo, and I were going out to make sure that the visibility is clear all around. Uh, so we're doing that live. When we go to the camera, instead of going up top, we're taking a look in our, on our laptop and making sure that we have visibility around it. So there's still kind of adjusting things, mm -hmm. but as far as our cameras, they're all working. Oh, okay. And sorry, one more thing. Do we have any updates? Um, Cause I know we sent out the email from the last meeting, but any updates about t the testing of the waters and um, the soil? Any no. state? So I've spoken to chief of staff or the staff uh, person at um, um, Assemblyman Otis's office. Mm -hmm. Shelly Mayor responds. She, she, she responds that she's received my email, but there's nothing from that. So I don't have anything. And I, there is one resident that I have to get back I, to. I, I did talk to Shelly and Steve mm -hmm. and they uh, they they talked, they, they, they had a meeting and information from the New York State Department of Health uh, that they were looking into further. Uh, you know, at the, the initial, and, and I'm, not, I'm not a doctor, and mm -hmm. is, but the initial uh, outlook was that, you know, it, 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 it doesn't have higher incidences than other areas, but they were gonna look at particular cancers that might have higher incidences okay. and check on that. Thank you. And I, and I think that they also imparted that to some members of the community, too. And as far as the county, when we reached out to the county last time we discussed this, it's not something that, that the Department of Health does. County. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, question for uh, that, that, uh, about for me. Yes. Uh, um, Thank you. Your outside employment, does that come to an end? What? Your outside employment? Oh, yeah. You, I, ended, I ended that when we finalized their um, affordable housing plan on July 7th. Okay. 
Okay. You're talking about across the river? Yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, so, so that's that's uh, that's there's no longer any uh, any uh, part time work. No. Nope. Okay. Great. We have your undivided attention. You do. That's what Every we intended. Day. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, invitation to address the board. Please remember that it's a three minute time limit. Uh, so the mic is open. Yeah, sure, sir. Going, guys. Okay, how are you? I uh, just remind everyone I'm the bike lane guy. Oh, hi, how are you? Uh, good to be back. Unfortunately, <laughs> someone's just left. I wanted to address them directly, but please state your name for the record. Oh, sorry, Mike Smeets. Uh, just wanted, oh, I will write it there. I uh, just wanted to remind you guys what I, I stated in that presentation, which I'm not here to hear it. Um, would really love them to consider uh, an alternative. Curb extensions are great. We need them, but an alternative to just expanding with more concrete, uh, with something like bollards or a floating island, something that's basically impermeable to cars. Cars can't go through it, but bikes, and also for our town where flooding's an issue, water can also go through it. Uh, the reason I bring this up is we're running into this issue uh, as I'm sort of trying to lay out pipelines everywhere in Larchmont where they put in these concrete curb extensions mm -hmm. and they're great and they help the pedestrians, but times have changed. More kids are biking to schools. We want to now put the bike lane, put the bike lanes inside the parking. So have street parking bike lanes so the cars protect the kids. Unfortunately, we can't just repaint them because these concrete curb extensions are in the way. So now we need to figure out how can we do this? Do we have to go around them? Can we demolish these curb extension, these concrete ones? So they're all, there are alternatives, and I just hope that they uh, have that in their design brief to consider that. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Just, um, you can fill out. Yes, I will fill it out. Thank yeah. you, and put it in the box so that we know to receive it. Yeah. And I think to that point, if we're interested in that, it's not just a matter of Mr. Smeets putting it out, yeah. but having us make yeah. it clear that they, that's a priority of the yeah. board. Anthony okay. Cordy, 123 Memorial Avenue. I'm here tonight to say, you have a problem with your transmission. It doesn't go out, broken up. Uh, and and I talked to I, I, I talked to the LMC manager. He said that it's a problem with cable vision. Maybe you can straighten it out, but I'm here tonight to tell you that. Okay, I'm here tonight also to tell you that our streets are choked down. The throughway uh, has an exit for Watchmont, and it's on our exit. Asking you to take the as the state to take that sign and move it down, let them go and get off and nourish shell. They didn't want it next to it anyway, so so just let it let, let it go down and nourish shell and let them get off in the city and not drive through our streets. Uh also You mean northbound, right? You mean northbound, Tony? Northbound. Yeah. Tompkins Avenue Bridge. Maybe the Corps of Engineers can work on that and just that because I don't want to hear 60 years with all this traffic with with the post road, which I think is going to take longer than the Tapaji Bridge. <laughs> Every morning, six o'clock in the morning, we're out there pounding away. Quality of life is no good. Throughway authority. Okay. People get floods, and the throughway authority does not care about us. The state of New York does not care about us. They took item four and they put it up there and they made a staging. That area used to be a little retain, retention pond there, okay? Mm -hmm. And what did they do? They filled it up with item four, parked all their vehicles, and we sit back and let them do it. And on top of that, if I want you to go up in the, on the entrance to the throughway just before the bridge. That used to be a swamp back there mm -hmm. on the right-hand side. They took and dumped, how, much, how many yards of soil have they dumped there, manager? Millions. Has it been tested? Millions. It's their property. How much is and there? It's their property, but I get I get it's it. their property. Oh, is it, so it's my property. I can do whatever I want. No, I, I get it. They come here and, and they dump water. They dump. They fill our retention ponds. They send it all down to us, and they don't give a damn about it. And we sit back and listen to them. Shame on you, and shame on me, and everybody. Thank you. Go up and look at it 
I did the five or six. Don't be the back of the bottle. Um, a few things. The students made uh, pr the uh, presentation for the uh, funding. And uh, a couple of things I'd just like to note. Uh, as already mentioned, the majority of the uh, students in the Mimernic Avenue, uh, in the Mimernic school system, actually live either in the town of Mimernic or Larchmont. But the other thing I wanted to mention, and this actually came from um, information that we attached is that um, the recommendation is for to teach the civics to children as young as 11, which would actually be Homics Avenue School. The, uh, um, it did not say anything about um, addressing and trying to teach eight to 10 year olds. I don't know if it's age appropriate to be trying to teach 10 year olds budgeting when they're just beyond Santa Claus. And uh, like I said, Lou, well, you, 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 if you actually read the article that you attached. I didn't, I didn't attach. Yeah, yeah they, they, what was the attachment? Yeah, in July. Yes, no, no, I, oh, in July. I, I think I, I had attached an article that I was able to yes. find through. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it uh, actually read RCM. the article. Not only did it say that it was initiated by municipalities, and if the students wanted to refine, but uh, age appropriation. I don't. I don't know if 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 you really, you know, if this is the type of thing that you 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 know would would stay with it, like a a, a nine or ten year old. It says, you know, at at that point. You're really not doing much budgeting with children that age. You make virtually every decision uh, that they make for them. They start picking out their own clothes and making their own financial decisions more at 12, 13. And that's probably more age appropriate if you want to start to teach children, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, basic budgeting when, when it comes to our village. And lastly, you know, they said about we come up with ideas and there's a committee that helps out and everything. Well, if we if there is some kind of a committee that's helping the students, it should be village residents that are on that committee. I'm not sure, you know, what 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 committee or who they have helping them. But at the very least, uh, anybody who's helping the students make uh, the decision about the village of Mamarnik, th those people should be from the village of Mamarnik. Uh, Halstead Avenue project, uh, just uh, very quickly, that has to be tied to the fact that we have a major paving project also with Halstead Avenue, because it would make no sense to spend all that money on the sidewalks if later on, when we have to do extensive paving, which includes, you know, excavation of all the junk that is underneath Halstead Avenue to set a base that we start ripping up or undermining what's getting done with all the sidewalks and everything. And at least has to have a cursory look to make sure that there is no effect when we go in there right after you finish the sidewalk project and you're going to do a, a major uh, 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 not just paving project, but a major reconstruction of the entire uh, Halstead Avenue uh, roadway. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. That's <laughs> Uh, I'm going to remove myself as a member of the Parks and Recreation Commission to talk on behalf of myself to Mark Hunter. Uh, I drafted up an email. You guys are going to get a copy of it along with the land, uh, Village of America uh, land use board as well. So it came to my attention last week that there's a large three-family construct being proposed at the 150 Madison Street property. The Washingtonville area in general historically has always been a dense populated area. Some agree that the area has already reached maximum residential capacity. 
We want to preserve and continue to improve our quality of life in Washingtonville. In short, we don't need large scale, multiple story new construction projects in the dense, uh, in the dense populated area. As a 30 year Washington resident and a dual flood victim, I'm asking very loudly at the Village of Mimaric Board of Trustees, the Village of Mimaric Land Use Boards, including the Architectural Review, Harbor and Coastal Zone Management Commission, Planning Board, Zoning Board of Appeal, to create and implement a building moratorium for the Washingtonville flood area until the village building codes and zoning laws are reviewed and changes are made to better protect the current flood victims of the Washingtonville area. The Village Board of Trustees, along with the Village of Mimaric Land Use Boards, in concert, must take a strong stance on creating, updating new zoning laws and building codes that forever unconditionally preserves the quality of life for my Washingtonville residents. The victims of these large scale multiple dwelling projects are the residents in the immediate area that are impacted directly. The communities held hostage and victimized by the building developers conveniently plan and use our backyards and homes as financial investments for personal gain and profit and build without empathy, sanction, and disregard for the Washingtonville community. Huge problem, folks. The Washingtonville area already has its fair share of large buildings in immediate areas, such as the Mason on Waverly Avenue, Grand Street Lofts on Grand Street, Avalon Willow on Mamaronic Avenue, 875 Mamaronic Avenue, which is across from the Mamaronic Avenue School, 101 Sheldrake Place at Columbus Park, and 225 Stanley Avenue. I'm calling out and calling on the entire Village of Mimaric Land Use Board's elected officials to step up now and strengthen and implement strong village zoning and building codes that meet and exceed flooding mitigation plans. If the Village of Mimaric can change and adopt new zoning laws for affordable housing, then you can change the exist, existing zoning laws to protect the flood victims of the Washington area. The time is now. We need to protect and ensure our quality of life and safety for all our Washingtonville residents. As first priority, this cannot be overlooked, negotiated, or compromised. I Thank appreciate you, your time. Today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to point out that I proposed the moratorium in the flood zone a couple of years ago. And uh, at that time, there wasn't support on the board for it. Uh, we, we, we could revisit that, and we are working on redoing the flood laws right now. Yeah, this is easy stuff. I think that as a village, all the boards get on the same drum piece. Thank you, sir. Garrett? Chair of Winchester, 1025, Cold Road. Uh, listen, I'm just to address the board. Uh, we had our block party last uh, week. Um, it was a good time. Two weeks. Two weeks ago. And it's, it was our 19th year. Uh, my cousin, LaVette Allen, back there. It's her baby. Um, it's the only block party, like I said, in the village of America that gives back. Every year they give a $1,000 scholarship to one or two people. This year, again, partnered with the CRC on backpacks. Uh, but why I'm here really is we applied for a permit. It took us probably about six weeks to get it, but usually it's quick. There was an issue uh, about timing. We rectified the timing. The timing was changed because the police department said they received a call last year of a, someone down there with a firearm, okay? At no time did the police department respond. I made a FOIA request of a report. I got the report. It said they responded along with the county. I called the county. The county has no response. I then went to the store in front of the park for an hour of video camera. No for police, no police showed up. Okay, that's a fact. No one there at the party saw the police show up. Okay, this year, one of the neighbors called the cops, five cops, four cops, and a lieutenant showed up. I asked, what's the problem? He says, well, there's an open container. The permit that we received from this village says that we're allowed to have an open container says we can't dispense or disperse in the street. We did not do that, okay? Now he asks, what should we do in the future? I said, you should tell the caller because they're serial callers, okay? We opened this block party to all Mamaric, we advertised to all Mamaric. The ones who call never come, but they call. 
Now, what the, should the uh, police do? They should say they're not in violation of their permit. Okay? They're law enforcement officers, not feelings officers. Okay? For 19 years, we've never had a problem. Okay? We clean the street. Now, if that park is dirty before or after we're, we're done, that is not our problem. Okay? Some folks think that we're responsible for all black folks in this village. No. Just like you guys are not responsible for all white folks in this village. But to sit here and call time after time for unwarranted things is ridiculous. And there are some things that are warranted their call, but not during this event. Next year, we will be having the 20th year. We plan to do really good. We, again, invite all, everybody, everybody in this village, be part of an only block party that gives back. There are a few people in this room that donated to that block party. Cash, check, time, and we thank you. But again, don't call police. Come out. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I could just uh, say that I, I was I was at the block party at about nine o'clock, and uh, walked through the party uh, twice. I stopped to talk to Jared for a while. To stop and talk to somebody else, and. To my eyes, I did not see anything wrong. Uh, and I know Lani spent a lot more time there than I did. I was there from about five o'clock until maybe 10.30, even helping clean up. So this is a discussion that we will have and we plan on having uh, with the upper echelon of the department. Randy, you're up, pal. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Randy. I'm working every morning. Um, most of you know. Um, I know you guys have a handful. You got a lot going on. Um, Jared, that was on the money. Um, I'm only here for small requests. Um, as you know, um, I don't really have. I have a lot of idle time, so I kind of wander around the village all the time on my bicycle. Um, I look for a place to relax, sit down, um, you know, just conversate with different people in the neighborhood. Um, so my request is that um, a lot of time I like to spend time in, I mean, um, in Columbus Park um, because it's, it's, it's peaceful. So, um, you know, I go to the harbor. I, I you know, I, I know Flint Park. I know maybe uh, Pay Park. Um, the only thing that missing from Columbus Park is um table like the picnic table mm -hmm. um a few times i meet with friends from last month at Mamaronek, and we have food but there's no table and so when we put our soda or drinks next to us on the bench unfortunately still sometimes you know we got a sticky bench but we need um you know like a picnic table that we see in the harbor pace park flame park there's like a little metal thing so one thing, you know, I know you're stretching a dollar all the time, so you kind of need that. Um, the other thing that I do all the time is light up and down Mamonic Avenue throughout the village. Um, there's certain times where all the benches there is full. So now I'm sitting here and there. Um, I was wondering if you guys would take the consideration and put more bench on the avenues. Um, there's bench in the old, in front of the old CVS. Sometimes there's no space to sit. It's in front of Snatchburger. Uh, there's nobody on the corner of Allstead, which is, you know, um, but I, I, I'm speaking for myself. I've seen a lot of people look around for places to sit. Um, I remember there was a time um, in front of Columbus Park where the, the brick wall is by the bridge. There used to be a bench there that faced out. Because, uh, you know, I can't sit in there at 10.30 in the park or 11 o'clock because curfew and I don't need $250 ticket. So is it possible for bringing more benches along the avenue for people that wants to be out? Because, you know, we like to enjoy the outdoor and, uh, and, and consideration of maybe you guys could put a couple picnic bench around in, in Columbus Park instead of just benches by itself. So I'm hoping you guys could take that in consideration. Certainly will, Randy. Thank you. And, uh, thank you. 
Thank you. We ran into each other the other morning in Harbor Island Park. You were eating your breakfast and I was eating my breakfast. <laughs> yeah. And we all know Ben's, but we enjoyed it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to go over for it. I'm on the traffic commission. I wish I had spoken earlier. I didn't have to follow these passionate speakers with important issues. My issues aren't quite as but they're important to me. Um, I'm here, I'm happy to see Mr. Smeets here. How are you doing? He spoke to our traffic commission, so I'm still going to spoke here. And I pretty much want to follow him in terms of the bike project. Uh, some months ago, I submitted the recommendations from the traffic commission and they covered the biking project, pedestrian safety, and parking issues. I'm happy to see the posted project. Dan had told us about that some months ago, and uh, what he said is because we had residents who had issues about sidewalks, and he said, don't worry, when, when the project is ready, you'll be able to make a recommendation, as often as the case, Dan was right on the money, that they'll have an opportunity to get their specific issues and suggestions. Right? Um, so I'm here to kind of give back the recommendations because there are 10 bullet points on the biking project and I'm happy that Mr. Smith was here again. Um, and that's why I'm here. I'd like to give this back at it. I don't know if you've kept the recommendations, but I know we're talking about a kind of plan later and this goes in line very quickly. May I give this back at you? Email it to I'll email it too. Yes, we love it. Yeah, I almost okay. killed it. I know. That's why I'm Thank you. 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 Thank Alrighty. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Good morning, FMAC, speaking for myself. So, uh, spoke about the dam in the reservoir tonight. Um, I think. First of all, the reservoir, I know I was part of the resolution, but I don't think the resolution is completely correct. And I think we should focus more on the reservoir than upstream of the reservoir. As you said in the work session, that you're gonna let the county off the hook. I think if they don't focus on the reservoir, they will be off the hook because they're gonna fix the golf course up and fix the ponds around there, improve the golf course and not improve the reservoir. We can't let them off the hook. We have to concentrate on the reservoir. You know, by doing other mitigation above that is not gonna work. This reservoir is put in place and it's the perfect scenario. Gino talked about the dam. Uh, I sent the, uh, the topographic map to you guys, the email I do. So, I disagree with Gino. I think the reservoir can be lowered. There's the, the elevation difference from behind the dam, the upstream side of the dam, to the bridge at Mamaroneck Avenue is 10 feet. That's the difference in the elevation. Conservatively, you can lower the reservoir eight feet at that point. And then from that point, from Amaranic Avenue all the way to the to the hutch is a 65 foot elevation difference. So to say that you can't lower the reservoir, you're really not looking at it the way I'm looking at it. And also you have the width of the reservoir. We have the we have the Canary Islands in the reservoir. There's there's islands, peninsulas. There's all sorts of things that are in the reservoir that should never be there. It should be from the Maronick Avenue to the hill at Saxon Woods, that wide, 
all the way down. The reservoir is one mile long. If you drive in the car, it's one mile long. And it could be lowered down. The dam could be fixed. The dam could be brand new. I think it's a waste of money trying to think about any other option. There's four options. You said all four are bad. I see three bad and one is great to have a dam. And controlling the water is one of the aspects of control is lowering the water, holding it back, releasing it, holding it back. The 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 H and H guys have to look at it like that too. This dam is doesn't work. They're going off of Army Corps is going off of people are saying 1975, uh, 2017. There's 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 no uh, there was there wasn't a technology back then. Thank you, Bernard. I, I understand. Okay. The time's up. I appreciate. My, my last my last thing is we this village made a mistake not doing the Army Corps project when it was up and up for grabs. They made a big mistake, the village, and we didn't do it. And we got the most flood water we ever did in history, okay? The dam and the reservoir Thank you. are one. Thank you. And let's not make a mistake. Thank you. Laura Roddy, 170 Washington Street. I'm a traffic, I'm a traffic commission, but I'm speaking as cousin. I piggyback off what Tim O'Connor stated in regard to the moratorium. Um, when you had presented it uh, about a year and a half, we supported that. And we're very sorry and we're regretful that it wasn't supported because we wouldn't be in this situation. We wouldn't be in a situation where <clears throat> numerous and countless emails are being sent to thwart building or irresponsible building in addition to what we've already are enduring. In addition to 150 Madison, 254 Center was just built for $900,000 where it has the capability of putting seven townhouses on the corner of Center Avenue and Waverly, right on the foot of the brook. Another natural dam in addition to the private transfer center in, in addition to the Mason, Avalon, and every other building that was placed in non-conformity on a 50 by 100 building lot, taking up more than its fair share. I, I, we don't have time to waste. I know it's coming and I know they're supporting that, but we need really tangible timelines where we're gonna move this forward. If all committees within the village of Remarinick are sitting in a consortium to work this out to get it moving because our time is ticking. You know, we're already under the water, we're in the red. One more storm like Ida, and a third of your village is gone and it's never coming back again. So we can't waste time. We can't waste time on any, any. The real issue is flooding and how to prevent it. The real issue is stopping architects from. Creating McMansions that are fitting on a footprint that can fit a shoebox and a, and a size five shoe. What are we doing? We're running in circles. And I want to, in, in addition to what Mr. Ford said, because I think he was right on the money. We've been flooded so many times, so many times, and there is a cancer cluster within the village of Marinick, whether the DOH wants to recognize it or not, because they did their best to screw those numbers. To minus out people who like they felt it belong and minus out three years because it wasn't in the ramifications of how they chose to you know put a PowerPoint presentation up you know to flatten out their numbers but the cancer's there and if we don't test the ground and soil after every rainstorm we're being foolish we're being foolish and we're hurting our residents I'm asking everybody to step up to the plate. It's a pretty simple fix. Just be concerned with what's happening. Whether it's good, bad, or indifferent for our village, we need to solve all the problems that are attacking the flood victims. And I think we need to move yesterday. We can't wait to another for another event. We're not going to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, first public hearing uh, is public hearing A. This is on land use board application notification. Uh, 
just before we open it, just in sum and substance, what this is, is an attempt to uh, make it more equitable for people who are applying for a building permit that they don't have to, uh, that, they, that they can get a refund if they don't get approved. Uh, I need a motion to open a public hearing. So Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 I, it, just for tonight, I'm going to do everything all in favor unless somebody says I'd rather not. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Uh, I'll speed it up a lot, Tom. Yeah, but it's, no, it makes it easier for the staff. Um, okay. My friend, Mr. Cutler, would you want to give us a, a little rundown here? explain what we are trying to do. There are many different land use approvals in the village of Maranek, dependent boards, uh, site plans, special permit, consistency determination, three structure permits, and almost all of them uh, in the current code have different notice requirements. Uh, so different sign requirements, some you know have to be within a certain distance of the road, others have to be a certain lettering. Uh, some have to be 200 feet, others have to be 400 feet, some even have to be just 100 feet uh, in terms of mailing your name. Uh, so this consolidates all of those notification requirements into one notification requirement that would apply to all land use board members. Any questions or concerns? And so it looks like we're eliminating a lot of things because we're crossing off all this stuff, but we're not. We're just consolidating it all into one mm -hmm. paragraph. That's correct. All, all public hearings that are public hearings yeah. remain public hearings. It was, it was, it was simplifying. It was streamlined. One big sign. Yeah. One big sign. Yeah. The, uh, the, Greg and uh, Mr. Spolzino have been working to try and chip away at the inconsistencies and in some of the... Uh, ridiculous aspects of our zoning code to make it more user-friendly. And I appreciate this. This is an offshoot of that. Any questions from the audience? And if I may, just, just to explain, as you said, we're trying to chip away and make things more consistent. Various laws have been written at various times and developed with their own separate notice report. So we're trying to incorporate it. And trustee Lucas, the reason there's a lot of crossing out, yeah. is instead of restating it multiple times, yeah. we're just we need one reason in referencing it. No, I'm just saying for yeah. people to look at it, it looks like we've crossed out a lot of stuff. Right. What we've done yeah. is consolidated everything. So yeah. it's much simpler. And you'll it, and and the key is there will be a sign for every a, a uniform sign, which is in some ways better than the mail, the piece of mail that you get. It, it made the editor in me smile. It made the editor in me smile. You, you no longer have to worry about what you're doing if you file a site plan approval yeah. during, you know, during July and you were born in June. Yeah, simplified. 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 Yeah. But if the uh, public. Okay. That being said, I need a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, Board want, I need a motion to adopt. Motion to adopt. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Perfect. Thank you. All right. The next item on the agenda is the uh, comp plan update. Uh, we have talked about this many times. We have the comp plan in front of us. Uh, I don't know how many public hearings we've had so far. Mm -hmm. uh, four, I believe. Four or five. Four or five. Thank you, Neil. In, in, uh, in the ether there is Mr. Neil Desai, who has labored long and hard on this. He's gone <laughs> gray in the process. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, we appreciate that. We look distinguished. <laughs> um, so, Neil, where are we tonight? I'll let you take the helm. Sure. So, uh, the we have the latest version of the comprehensive plan. The September 12th public hearing draft has been posted at planvom.org. Uh, and this version includes uh, in highlights 
let's see if I can show some examples here. In highlights, what parts of the comprehensive plan were adjusted, either added or revised? What 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 sections were revised based on the comments received from the public? Um, and uh, those are, and in, in, in a number of cases, uh, the public comments were um, corrections. Some of them, and and you know, very we could receive a good body of comments, including uh, uh, several over the weekend, which I also incorporated into an updated table of comments and responses. Um, but this is just to make it easier. It's not the easiest, but it's at least uh, uh, an indication of what changed based on the public comments that were received. And so um, one can look at uh, the, um, what's also been posted is the, this is the comment, the latest version of the comment and response matrix. Um, it's anywhere on the right here where there indicates there, there will be a change. That's what the yellow highlights um, uh, signifies. And so, you know, obviously, you know, the public comment is is absolutely a very important part of this. So, um, you know, I made to be sh sure to be very diligent about what people submitted, making sure every comment has been uh, cataloged here on this table and responded to. Not everything, res not everything, not every comment led to a change in the comp plan. Um, uh, it was just sometimes it was just a reference to something to help clarify uh, uh, or something that they're asking about. Uh, and then some of them did lead to changes. Now there was um, in the comments received uh, over the weekend, over email, uh, we th those are included in this table uh, along with a response. Um, there is a minor uh, change, a removal uh, of a passage in a document in the, in the, the latest draft. Um, that um, is indicated will be done. So I, I, I presume that should the board um, uh, uh, eventually adopt this tonight, um, that should I would I would assume that would be the the something that would be in the resolution uh, pending this minor change uh, in the comp plan. So essentially, what would happen next is if should should uh, you know. Of course, we want to hear from anybody in the public who still has anything they want to say in this public hearing. Um, should the board wish to adopt uh, the comprehensive plan tonight, uh, then the next step would me would be for me to convert this, uh, make that make that small change based on the comment that's indicated on this table, and simply uh, change the remove all the highlights, and make this the adopted version of the comprehensive plan. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah. Good, Mick. Cutley, you have anything to add? No. Um, um, Neil, and where you have listed the um the the, the, the appendix of the appendix, uh, the parks. A15, A16. Yeah, A15, A16. Columbus Park is not listed here. Is there a In reason? the appendices. <laughs> no, Columbus. Uh, you mean on the appendix E of the comp plan? What you, you said is that what you're talking about? I'm looking at at the bottom page A15 A16. I don't know how you're reading it. Oh, it's on it's on A14. Columbus uh, page A14 has Columbus Park shown. Okay. okay. So yeah, that's good. definitely not not something I'd want to miss. That's a uh, but yeah. Let me just uh, it's show just that our, our papers are out of work. No, you got it. Out of, out of all right, all right, all right. Well, my yeah. bad. All right. Thank you. Okay, Neil, uh, not Neil, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Cutler. We've included uh, the last agenda of the Perry Boy Bird, which is a link to uh, environmental document that we have to work one, two, and the draft three, which would be reduction for consideration of the negative declaration. That's to say that the uh, offerhand, comprehensive plan will not result in significant hazards. And it's all included in the same resolution. So we've included the documentation to support that. So no, I understand, but but the uh, everything we have to approve is in one resolution. Yeah. Thank right. that the consistency yeah. and the adoption. In that order, the way I read it. All right. 
along with anybody on the board? Um, yeah, there was a we got an email. I think we all got it. Um, pointing out some uh, alleged or perceived uh, inconsistencies with the plan mm -hmm. and the LWRP, which is the oh, local waterfront local reasons. waterfront revitalization program. Mm -hmm. And um, and I uh, wanted to uh, just point out that uh, that this mm -hmm. this comprehensive plan uh, may have some um, uh, inconsistencies with some existing legislation. But that would mean that simply that uh, we would be tasked with uh, finding as we go along to, to, to try to bring it, bring the legislation into performance. Yeah, no? if, if I may, I can actually yeah. respond yeah. to that. Yeah, um, sure. In particular, um, that comment was related to a restaurant. Um, a restaurant. Yeah, well, and also uh, a recommendation to modernize or to, to do changes with the chief of buffer, mm -hmm. unless I'm thinking of a different. No, this, this, so this, this, this was about. Uh, th this was a you could talk about the strategic buffer because that's actually important too. So, but this was about uh, water dependent uses and restaurants not being water dependent uses. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so I think what was outlined in the plan talked about residence uses um, in this in the commercial district being within fifty feet of of any waterway. Okay. And that that was a new law that was adopted in twenty nineteen. So it was it's recommended to. Just, just that new law. It's PLLC. Yeah, just that portion is recommended in the comp plan yes. to be considered for, for revisiting. So what, what happened in that law was it prohibited anything from happening uh, within the 50 foot setback of a waterway. Uh, you could not appeal it. You could not go to uh, the zoning board to appeal it. It was, uh, you know, a, a, a dictate. And what that happened what in practicality, what that means is that deteriorated properties, uh, properties that are dilapidated, you couldn't really do much with them because you couldn't do anything in a 50 foot right away. And there was so many buildings that abut the river. So there's no room for improvement. It was cementing. Um, it was uh, cementing bed mistakes practice. in place. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, anybody from the public? Do you want to? Can we address that restaurant comment too? The restaurant the one. The, the the comment was that restaurants aren't water dependent uses. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people in the community have asked for a restaurant on the water. Mm -hmm. You know, th this board is not advocating for that, but I think that uh, Mr. Desai put it in the cap uh, in, into the plan because it is something that people are asking for, and oh, I, I have been. Yeah approached dozens of times yes. in the time I've been uh, in office. Why can't we have something in the park where we could eat and wouldn't it be nice? And it might be, and, but we're, we're not making that choice here. And hey. what, well, let me just finish. And uh, you know, waterfront dining is water dependent, right? Uh, if we choose to have waterfront dining, um, we definitely have it at all the clubs. Uh, all the clubs, one of their main attractions is dining by the water. Uh, and I'm not advocating for that, but I'm just saying, you know, that, that's what people uh, who answered Mr. Desai uh, asked for. And we just put it in there and it, it'll be up to some other board someday if they ever decide to look at it. I, I also think specifically a restaurant in the park was something that was discussed in um, the agents. Well, also the agents, but also in the Harbor Island Master Plan, which has never been adopted. So yeah. um, it would still have to go through. It would, it would have to go through HZMC and planning and everything else. But it's just a, still a reminder that, you know, this is not the board's comp plan. This is still the community's comp plan. Yeah, so yeah. We can always include other people's mm -hmm. suggestions as we should and as we have. And, so, and, and to clarify, just just to kind of hone in more, really the 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 public comment. I'm sorry. Is there another? Did you want to say more? No, go ahead, Neil. Okay, sure. Um, really, it, the comment was it, it's it's actually a passage from the it's it's a quote from the 2012 comp plan that is in the in our current comp plan, and on page 143, and the um, uh, the the pub the comment that we received was that uh, the that um, 
incur the, the comment on the left side here, it says encourage an appropriately sized destination restaurant on the waterfront in accordance with the goals of the Harbor Master Plan. And, and I, and, you know, she said, there's no place, it's not specifically mentioned in the Harbor Island Master Plan. And so I reviewed the Harbor Island Master Plan. And as far as uh, she, it's correct, there is no specific mention of a destination restaurant in the in the waterfront on the Harbor Island Master Plan. So essentially, it's not a this is not a current recommendation. It's a recommendation that's quoted from 2012. And um, so the 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 response to that is, um, you know, you're correct that the, the 2012 plan attribution of the goal of a destination restaurant on the waterfront to the Harbor Island Master Plan is erroneous. And so that little that little passage should be removed. Um, I didn't see anything in the in reviewing the Harbor Island Master Plan about a restaurant. And so it's a reference from the 22, 2012 plan. I, I can tell you from having sat on the Harbor Island Master Plan Committee in 2003 and 04, it was discussed. Mm -hmm. It was discussed extensively and people came and made presentations right. about it, but it wasn't uh, included. And for good or bad, we've never adopted that. Harbor Island Master Plan. Right. That's out of date. Yeah. Go, Neil. So, uh, That's all. And I, I don't want to balloon this discussion a little too far, Bridge, but yeah, too late. Um, <laughs> the, the, there was there was a draft LWRP taking around a few years ago. That's that near near completion. Um, and one of the things that it tried to do was better define. Um, water dependent and water related uses mm -hmm. and so you can you could look at that at a future date you know yeah. and just investigate. we still have to update to. that Thank right you. that's where yeah. we are <laughs> and, and the term water dependent is not a legal term is it is it is it a yeah it is in our code is it's it an, it is in the lwrp yeah. and you which is which is a yeah. state federal which is water a federal program dependent, which is like marina is like and water related, which is like recreational. Well observed. Um, okay. So are we, I'm sorry, are we keeping the um, that quote about the uh, waterfront? No. Okay. All right. Uh, I need a motion. I need a motion to close the poll here. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Now I need a motion. So after five years to finally adopt uh, the updated, uh, <laughs> the, the updated, no. the updated comprehensive plan. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Congratulations. Aye. Okay. <laughs> this is a major achievement. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Excellent. That is excellent. Neil, thank, thank you, you for all your help. You, My pleasure. Hey, um, have you have you yet watched the show I told you to watch? I I remember, I, I vaguely remember you saying something about the show. What Ted show Lasso. is that? Ted Lasso. Oh, yeah, right. I don't have the HBO. Uh, I gotta I gotta figure that out. <laughs> he, he looks just <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> all right, thank you very oh, much. Oh, oh, you mean yeah, the, uh, yeah. Yeah, doesn't he? Yeah. The Wonder Crunch. Crunch. Neil, 12 years ago, we passed um, um, form based codes, right? In Hamilton. In Hamilton. Neil was very instrumental in passing form codes. Oh, 12 you know, years later. So we've I've only done two things with Neil 12 years apart. Okay. That's it. <laughs> right. and, and, and this almost took 12 years. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thanks. I track this for the for the more for the moratorium at the LLC. So which Neil also worked on. All right, all right, all gang. Right, right. Let, let's try. Right. Let's try and uh, right. through this abstract of audited vouchers with reports. Uh, there is a change to the audited vouchers. Uh, the original total was uh, amended. It is now nine hundred twenty-five thousand five hundred and seventy dollars and ninety-seven cents, and that was because uh, it was on page uh, seven. Under Abraham Fenster, uh, it, it said uh, 6451, but it was actually 6341. It was, as my friend Mr. Sonoff would say, there was a Scribner's error. So that, that's the change. 
Right. Any questions or concerns? None. No. Nope. I'd like a motion, please. So so second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Thanks. Thanks. Good night. Get home safe. Uh, resolution. Uh, okay. Uh, public hearings, audit of bills, no old business. Uh, 4A, resolution approving budget amendment to increase PD detail revenue overtime for Waverly, Waverly Avenue bridge detail. What this is, is the town is uh, replacing Waverly Avenue bridge. It's going to need extensive uh, police oversight because it, it's gonna create a bit of a traffic snafu. Uh, the uh, town is are the, are the people who are uh, doing it and uh, they are going to charge their contractor and uh, then we will play our police uh, officers uh, to do the work. Are we reimbursed for that? Yeah, that, that's okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's um, two officers, four hour stints. Mm -hmm. um, you can like, please. Two officers, four hour stints for about 200 days. Mm -hmm. Nice. When we say in my business, you gotta make hay when the sun shines. My friend? Thank you, I'm getting there. Thanks. Glenn, 506 Oak Street. Hi, Glenn. Um, I just don't like uh, the wording. You're, you're fine with the overtime, but I wouldn't, I would not um, say it's two officers for whatever. It's going to be whatever amount of officers is, are needed over the course of six months. If you want to start with a million dollars, because I don't see any way that two officers are going to be able to handle the amount of traffic that you have to deal with at eight o'clock in the morning. You're probably going to need more like four officers. Uh, Hoyt Avenue and Mimarnik Avenue is a, is, is, a, is a problem because if you make the right on Hoyt Avenue, you run right into another traffic light. Um, if you don't have somebody directing now that you have to stop sign on um, Fedemore Road, if you don't have a uh, police presence there, you're gonna have people blocking the intersection uh, coming from Waverly Avenue. You may also find out that you're gonna have some trouble on Rockland Avenue and Palmer as all the businesses that normally use Waverly Avenue to uh, to go out there, uh, Mr. Chimney, Rotor Rooter, there's a lot of businesses that are in the industrial section that may decide well, let's uh, go and use Rockland Avenue instead, which already can take two to three traffic lights when you're talking about early in the morning on a uh, on a school day. So I don't want the town coming back and saying, oh, you only said it was two officers. That's what I, we I would, I would simply say, you know, that the amount of officers necessary for the amount of time and for the hours that are necessary, adjusted as we see the traffic patterns, uh, put a million dollars in there, and if you need to come back for more, you come back for more. Thank you. You want uh, in that last whereas clause, just strike everything from um, the two hours to the right. gap estimate. No, it, what do we do if it's over this though? Well, it's reimbursable, so it's yeah, a yeah. it's a zero sum game. Okay. We're all we're doing is approving the pest through. We're, mo we're modifying the budget to we're modifying the budget because we didn't put this in our budget. Yeah, I mean we didn't mm -hmm. have I mean, a. You're not. You're not necessarily. We're not. You're not hold. You're not held to the two officers. This, I mean, this is not an agreement with the town of America. No, this is. I mean, I think just that's fund the, the budget the based point. on the yeah. anticipated. You know. Yeah. And this is just based on the... included in the budget because we knew that it might be coming, Point but we budget. didn't know what the plan was. We didn't have a plan at the time. I mean, we knew there was something. Yep. We knew modifying something. the expense by the same. About your modifying the revenue. This is based upon the chief's recommendations. Yep. I need a motion. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Street closures for Spooktacular and the Turkey Trot. Uh, turkey Trot will be on November 19th and it'll be closing a bunch of streets from 9 15 a.m. to 11 30 a.m. Spooktacular is Sunday, October 22nd, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Maronick Avenue from Halstead. Uh, down to Post Road. Uh, I'll make the motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Bench donation. 
Resolution accepting a bench donation in the East Basin. You had a question? Yeah. It's just there were two different resolutions. I don't know if that matters. No, it was on one resolution. No, it wasn't. It was all on one. Uh, Mr. Ray Colaseco is uh, desirous of donating a bench uh, in the East Basin in memory of Christopher Colaseco. And the donation is $2,329.80. And we thank Mr. Colaseco uh, for his generosity. And I will make a motion to accept that. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Justice court ordered is uh, not for tonight. Uh, New York State retirement reporting. Yeah, that's specified. Yeah, so this, Sally, you want to pick up Mike. Sally to Mike, please? Mike her. What? It's like, I mean, how, how do they calculate that? It's it's based upon ether. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> how does that work? What this is, is, is for elected officials uh, to report to the state uh, for the pension service. You did it a few months ago. You gave me the numbers. Yeah. And I reported it in April. And then they just got back to us next week saying that putting down that you were elected in December of 2021 and you're going through December of 2024 or whatever it is uh -huh. is not good enough. We need the specific date. So that's the only change. December 1st, 2021 to December okay. 5th, 2024. Wasn't good enough to have the month and year we needed the day. So that's why it's being and, revised. And, and the and the hours that they have on it? Six hour work day. What? Everybody does a six hour work day. <laughs> <laughs> and and we're all we all have different so, so how, how did they you forget? gave us the numbers, and then we use, there's a formula we use to calculate. Oh, right, so it's not our you actual. Keep a three month calendar. Oh, got it, got it, got it. Okay. The, the, this says a uh, pressing to keep the three month calendar yeah. to think about how much. This says bi weekly. Bi weekly, I work fourteen hours. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. We all know it's that you work more number. than that. It's 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 I it's not it's not entirely 100 percent at all. All right. Uh somebody need to make a motion. So moved. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Uh 4F resolution amending chapter 326, no stopping on Hoyt Avenue. Okay, this this is part of uh a, a, this is a stop sign. It's going to be going well, it's it's going to be in front of the ice house. Uh, no, 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 that's a, that's a, that's next. Oh, so I'm sorry. No, no, stopping on Hoyt I'm sorry. This is just uh, to move traffic through, stuff. move traffic through more uh, quickly when the bridge is being built. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, have we spoke with Del Marvell and the other uh, Halfway and such, and the businesses there uh, that have the tractor trailers that normally do uh, double park as they. Uh, try to arrange to um, either drop off or to pull into the loading docks. And we have, uh, either they have personnel or we're gonna have personnel that'll be able to stop traffic. Because normally what, what the, the trucks do is they, they'll they'll uh, they'll stop on a point and then they have to block traffic in order to move, maneuver into the loading docks over there. Well, this is the other side. Yeah, this is the other side. So the, 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 the Miranda Avenue yeah. set. Yeah. This, this is this to okay. it's to facilitate the targeting movements mm -hmm. of trucks um, from the Miranda County. All of the businesses in the area have been aware and involved. Okay. Yeah. Just crossing all the teams. Thank you. I'm going in for surgery after 22nd. You're gonna miss me for a month, I so I gotta get my right. last <laughs> I, I wish you nothing Good luck. Thank you. Good luck. Good luck. Yeah. Uh Okay, I need a motion. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, for G, always stop at Fenimore and Hoyt. Uh, this is uh, memorializing what's going on there already. Uh, we added a stop sign outside of the ice house. Uh, and this is part of uh, moving traffic safely through that area. I need a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. 4 H, uh, revised bond. Jerry, you want to talk about this? Revising the bond. Okay. You want to talk about a little more detail? <laughs> I, I, I can do this. this is 
we don't the bond for the sewer project. Yeah. We have to revise the bond to the amount that we spent total so we can also uh, do the closeout and get the financing through the Environmental Facilities Corporation. So the bond has to equal what we spent. Okay, gotcha. John, have any backup though? We got it very late on Friday. That's not an excuse. I did put it off oh, today. Okay. This? Yeah. Okay. It was the paper went out. The paper went up, but things go online until today. I got it. So, this isn't you financing, this is just for the paperwork to close out the old financing. Yeah. So, for those who, who didn't hear, it's yes, it's for it's for the, the, to allow us to do the financing. Thank you. Uh, anybody want to make a motion? Uh, so moved. You can read it out. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I, I'm abstaining because I didn't read anything about it. I just didn't even, I, okay. in fact, I realized I sent you a note saying it wasn't there and that's as far as I got. I didn't go back online after I downloaded it. Okay, it was it was on there today though, right? It was on there today. Uh, I thought I saw, but... okay. Right. Resolution schedule a public hearing on PLL uh, V. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, if, Mark, for, just as for uh, future references, if we do get something on the day of, then it just should it automatically be omitted because just in case some some of us do not have the time on a Monday or Tuesday mm -hmm. to look at it and well, during a day. I, I don't think there should be a blanket policy because sometimes something comes in and it has to be acted upon you know, in an exigent kind of circumstance. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where we are in this situation. But I think that the staff makes Herculean efforts to try. No, to I, yeah, most it. definitely. I, I mean, we all, yeah, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying this in general. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Resolution scheduling a public hearing on PLLV amendment uh, chapters uh, 186, 240, 294, and 350 regarding building, planning, and zoning fees. I think we discussed this in the work session. In the work session. Mm -hmm. okay. A question? No concerns? Nope. I know. But can Bob, can you explain it just briefly only because, you know, a lot of people don't watch the work session and I think it, this is important. If we're doing a really good thing. So the issue is there's an inconsistency. We're problem that the way the code requires the building permit fee, building permit application fee to be collected is that it requires that to be collected up front. The building permit fee in immediately as soon as the application is made. The building permit fee is, is substantial. It's based on a percentage of the construction price. And what happens is there are applications that have to go before board for approval. If they don't get approved, there's no way to get the money back that is already been paid, even though the village never actually considers whether the building permit should be granted. So try to deal with that problem, prompted the planning department, the building department, and the legal department you look at the whole scheme of how fees are paid for building permits and, and, and other applications for land use and when they have to be paid. And we come up with this plan now that provides for an upfront fee. I think it's $150 that is the initial review. The building department of planning will determine what other approvals are required. Based on that, you pay for the next step. The applicant pays for the next step. If there are no board approvals required, there's right to a building permit application, the building permit fee is collected. If there are board approvals, there are small fees for that. They're not based on value of construction. It goes to the boards, if they get the board approvals are paying, it, the building permit fee is then collected and the building permit review occurs. Uh, it also provides that with respect to fees that have been collected in the past six months, the building permit fee can be refunded if no, if a board approval was required in one of the things. So we're trying to address that unfairness in the existing code and then go forward, update the process and how the fees are collected to be consistent with the amount of work that the village is doing in addressing the applications. So nobody has to write a really big check in the event they're not going to get the permit, they write they they'll write their check when they get the permit. There, there was yes, and uh, it's to make life more equitable for our residents. I'll make the motion. Second. 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Oh. Okay. We're just scheduling the public hearing for two weeks. Right? Yeah. Uh, uh, ethics board funding. This is 4J. Uh, the ethics board has asked for uh, an appropriation to conduct an investigation. Uh, and uh, the village board is considering uh, funding that. Anybody have any questions, concerns? The amount is? $10,000. Yeah. And uh, we, we, we created a, a line item for the ethics board, did we not? Yes. We created a line item for the ethics board. They didn't have a line item in the budget. Okay. And it's a not to exceed. And it's a not to exceed, yes. All right. Uh, I'll make the motion. Second. Uh, call the roll. You, you, you're muted, pal. Sorry. It's okay, but I see rolling. Yes. Trustee Azurid? Abstain. Trustee Young? Yes. Trustee Lucas? Yes. Mayor Murphy? Aye. Thank you. Okay, we're adding an item to the agenda. I need a motion to add an item to the agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The, the item that we're adding to the agenda. <laughs> the, the, the item that we're adding to the agenda. Uh, this is a request from the, uh, well, the press is leaving, and this is the important part. <laughs> oh, you, you don't want to miss this. You don't want to miss this. Catch on the video. Uh, the, 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 the item that we're adding to the agenda, and this is a request from the Environmental Committee, uh, because they've been doing so much work uh, to try and save uh, pollinators. And the, the most important pollinator they're trying to save right now is the monarch butterfly. And apparently, the milkweed is the monarch butterfly's uh, favorite food. So but that's not the best part. They, the best they, they want to designate uh, the vill village flower as the milkweed. And they will be announcing this at the monarch butterfly festival. Mm -hmm. It's on September 30th it is. Uh, down in Harbor Island Park. Mm -hmm. And this is all made possible. Because I joined the Monarch Butterfly Mayor Association. Yes, the Monarch Mayor. And uh, the guys at work don't know yet. No, wait till they find out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Marina made a costume. Okay. <laughs> so, with that being said, uh, I, I I will make a motion to designate the official flower of the of the village of Mamaroneck. Uh, <laughs> the milkweed. And as Jerry Barbario uh, pointed out, uh, a, a, a species that hates the milkweed is the spotted lantern fly. That's correct. Toxic. To it's toxic to them. So this might have an added uh, so it's benefit. benefit. Pro butterfly, anti lantern. Fly. Yes. Yeah. There you go. That's All right, make the motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Well, it's real government. Uh, what from the village manager? Oh, address the board. You, you, you don't need that. You're all right, right? There you go. <laughs> I, I just wanted to uh, mention one thing. I, I, had you I saw the presentation on the uh, Friday Film Festival, yeah. and I heard you mention cans. So I was wondering, um, uh, what is our policy going to be on the paparazzi on our uh, beach? And are we going to form a uh, committee to oversee that? If yeah. so, just let me know if there's any openings. Yeah, Thank you, you got it. You got <laughs> it. Thank you. Paparazzi. Paparazzi. But I think it's con. It's also yeah. anyway, isn't it? It's con. It's con. con. I think it's just con. con. Yeah. It's spelled with an S, but in French, yeah. it's just con. I know what I'm talking about. Well, you said can. Yeah, you, you agreed with me. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, address from village, report from the village manager. We had report from the clerk treasurer. We have none tonight. Report from Mr. Village Attorney. Um, yes. Excuse 
And then I'm going to report that there are three local laws that the board passed that were filed with the Secretary of State and became effective on August 18th. Local Law 12, which amended the housing discrimination provisions of the code. Local Law 13, which uh, amended the code to establish legislation regarding abatement of nuisances. <clears throat> and in number 14, which amended the code regarding the administration of fair affordable housing, the law will be filed at an LL. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Okay, we have uh, minutes, commissions, boards, committees, minutes of the Board of Trustees work session, regular meeting of August 14th, and minor items meeting of August 28th, minutes of the Board of Ethics meeting of June 21st, minutes of the Tree Committee meeting of July 23rd, minutes of the Budget Committee meeting of August 8th, and minutes of the Arts Council meeting of July 6th. I have July 6th on the Tree Committee. Okay. Okay. Uh, with that amendment. Uh, See, this is, we will meet again on the 26th, uh, Tuesday, because of the uh, 25th is a holiday. Uh, so I'll see you all back here in two weeks. I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 October, our first meeting in October is also on a Tuesday. Yeah. 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 Um, no. Today.